Give me just a second, shit. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shatadra Holmes. Most of you know me by Chick, and I'll be your host this morning. Welcome to Breakfast of Champions, hosted by Maryland Denise Coaching Services, Monday through Friday at 6 a.m. Our lines open as early as 5.30 a.m. for those of you that want to get you some coffee or bagels, some juice, water, or simply just get in the mood with the baddest DJ in the land, that's Nene. I know most of you know Nene. She gets us started real early in the morning and it's always something that can get you start, get your day started or, or get your thoughts in the right, right place. So we just thank you, Nene. We so much appreciate you. We're so appreciative of you. So um, just come on in and let's get started, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before we do, we're gonna invite the father into the room. Most, most kind and gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that was not promised. You are Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and we praise your holy name. We thank you for a good night's rest, and we ask that you give us complete guidance and your hedge of protection for this day that all that we do and say bring you glory. Let us not make any plans without you, dear Lord. We need you, Father God, every hour. Please watch over our families, the, the sick and shut in, and anyone that was without power, Father God, over the night or, or just the last couple of days during this frigid weather. Please provide them with warmth and shelter and food and protection. Keep us safe on the roads as we go to our destinations for the day. We ask this in Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Okay, before um, we get into anything, I want to uh, say thank you to Ms. Joyce Lynn yesterday uh, for coming in and sharing with us um, a lot of things. I say that these new generation is coming in with, um, showing us how to dress and what they're wearing for uh, this season. It really made me stand up and, and uh, I think about what I wanted to wear um, for the next place that I go to or, or just really just dressing ourselves and, and caring about the things that we wear. Did any of you have anything that you'd like to share from yesterday with Ms. Joyce Lynn? I do believe this was her first time with us. Anybody y'all up this morning? Good morning, Chick. Uh, well, I would definitely say, well, a good morning to you, first of all. Um, love seeing you in the morning time. Um, I know a lot of our ladies are probably uh, out. The weather is still bad in some areas, but uh, Mrs. Jocelyn did a wonderful job. You know, like she, like you said, that was her first time coming in, but I think she was more excited than anything, <laughs> you know, but uh, just listening and thinking about all those different uh, trends and, uh, you know, because we want, we want to stay as fly as we can, but, you know, uh, what they say, make sure you stay in your lane or whatever, because I know some of that stuff ain't in my lane, but, you know, we do look, want to look good and we do want to represent also, you know, within Breakfast of Champions, wherever we go. Uh, just remember, you know, you know, um, I always try to represent the people that I am around and the organizations that I'm around, you know, different things like that. You know, I never want to bring any type of, um, uh, I don't know, a different look upon myself to say that I don't belong anywhere. I do belong somewhere. I got a family. I'm a mother. I have to think about I'm a mother. So I can't be out there dressing like the hotties and, you know, stuff like that. And <laughs> But it was good to uh, have those fashion tips on yesterday. And then also, I think, you know, I'm that um, that person that's always thinking uh, entrepreneurship. And I started thinking about individuals that may want to, you know, start their own blog. Uh, they may not be out in the forefront like many of us uh, speaking out before others. But if you ever thought about doing maybe a blog or a, uh, I think I lost Miss Chick. <laughs> uh, I'm Ms. still here. 
Okay, gotcha. Okay, uh, we may uh, may not have thought about uh, thought about it, but we can do like blogs, and you know, you can do writing, and if you want to do the the blogging, the videos, you know, try your hand on something different. I always say it's good to have different uh, streams of income coming in your home, and and if you're going to do that, do something that you enjoy doing. So um, I do enjoy enjoy uh, reading different articles that people have, you know. So I love the way she came in with just you know, different ideas. And, um, you know, because if you don't like that nine to five, you're going to have to find something to do, you know? <laughs> so I would not recommend you just get up and walk away from something, but try your hand at something different and, you know, see where, see where the Lord is at and then get you some type of a coach that would help you to uh, work out all the flaws and, you know, all the little wrinkles in it, you know, so you could do it. So I did, I really enjoyed her. Uh, being in with us. And I hope that, you know, all of our different guests that they spark us, you know, to want to do something different as well, or to look into your bank of, you know, um, uh, gifts to see what God has in store for you as well. So I really, really enjoyed that. And thanks uh, for letting me share this morning. Yes, ma'am. I When I got off the line, I asked uh, my daughter Hope that uh, TISD had closed down yesterday. And I said, you know, I realized that your gifts and talents will make room for you. I said, and uh, you've got a lot going on and, and you found your niche. I said, it seems like it's something more that I should be doing. And so, yeah, on that entrepreneurship vein and that vein, I thought there seems like there's something more that I can be doing. But right now, God has, has got me just in a quiet place as, as I uh, embark upon my uh, 50th birthday. I'm, I'm just in a, a quiet place place, uh, still talking to God and listening, which is what uh, prayer uh, does for me. And I say prayer because right now we're reading a book um, through our church on prayer by Philip Yancey. And so if I, if I mention prayer a lot, it's just because that's on my mind and, and always in my heart, because to me, that's the communication uh, between uh, you and God, that's uh, you're listening and, and you're you're also speaking and asking God uh, questions. And I think it's okay um, to ask God questions. Many times I have asked God, is, am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Um, am I um, listening and am I following your instructions? And then I wait uh, quietly to uh, hear from him, uh, which makes me think of a question I thought of this morning when I woke up how many of us do the right thing when no one is looking, when there's no accolades, no pats on the back, but just simply doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Um, we've been tempted, uh, many of us, I'm sure uh, we're, we're always tempted, uh, the devil is on his job to try to get us to do things uh, for the wrong reasons, uh, whether it's for, uh, like I said, the accolades, pats on the back, or, or even for monetary reasons. We um, have the opportunity to do those things and maybe it's not the right thing, but we do them because, um, you know, we, we want to uh, uh, just have the attention, but how many of us sit back and think, no, I'm not going to do that. I want to, uh, I want to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And I just want to ask if anybody has, has ever thought about that or been tempted to do the wrong thing and thought I'm going to do the right thing even though no one is looking. Uh, anybody want to share this morning? Yes, ma'am, I do. Uh, can y'all hear me? Because my Wi-Fi out here is not that good. We can hear you. Okay, yes, ma'am. I, I, uh, I have done that many a times, want to make sure that I'm doing what was right. Uh, my mom used to say uh, when we were little, she said, baby, make sure you find yourself doing the correct thing and the right thing at all times, because I don't want to shame God and I don't want to shame my family or uh, anybody that um, I'm coming in alignment with Christ, my church home, um, this group or anything, because when we are growing in Christ, he, everybody's not going to agree with everything that you say, or they'll be saying, I can remember when she was or whatever have you, but I'm trying to stay focused on what's right uh, in my marriage. I enjoy the talks in the morning. I enjoy seeing you chick on here every morning. You're very encouraging. Uh, you look absolutely beautiful. And I, uh, 
it's it's just good to be in a in amongst uh, people that are like you that are growing that are transparent we all um loving on one each other and helping each other out uh when we're not having a good day because some days when you wake up you don't be in a good way and then you get in this room and you can say okay i can go on just a little bit further because this is kind of like therapy to me because Everybody don't have a therapist, uh, someone that they can talk to. And I enjoy uh, listening to uh, each other talk and communicate. And we all just want to do right. And so, yes, uh, I do agree with that because I, I want to make sure I'm doing what's right. And when I'm not right, I want some sisters to be able to tell me, hey, Tamika, you, you know that went right. And we shouldn't get mad when our sister try to uh, tell us and we get corrected Uh uh, by uh, our loved ones, the people that we say we love and we enjoy being around. So it's good uh, seeing everybody and hearing from each other this morning. And Jocelyn was uh, absolutely beautiful. I got to meet her on uh, Saturday when uh, Miss Merlin was out speaking. And uh, she is so kind and so sweet. And she dresses so sweet and nice. She complimented my dress. I complimented her attire. And uh, she's just a sweet girl. So I do um, think about that when she said Barbie dolls. I remember when I was little and I used to dress my Barbie dolls and I used to say, when I grow up, I'm going to dress like this when I get big or whatever. But uh, back then we had paper dolls. I was telling my husband about when I had paper uh, dolls, I used to color them with the markers and crayons because I wanted them to look a certain type of way. And I used to make sure that if I, hi I highlighted them, I highlight them in black, but I did it lightly. So, yeah, thank y'all for letting me share this morning. Well, thank you for coming on, and I miss seeing you in the mornings now that you're working in a, a different place, but you always dress nice, and I think that's a gift God gave to you. You're, you decorate your home, you make the, the uh, different things for people's homes at Christmas and Valentine's Day and, and just different occasions, and I think that's a skill or a gift that God has given you. Um, I tried that um, one time, and I, I don't think that that was what God had given me to do. However, I appreciate you and, and your skills and, and coming in um, to talk with us this, this morning. And every day, I'm like you, I like they're coming in. I pour out our hearts to one another. And I want to say that many of the ladies that I've come to this live to me, uh, even some in the past, we stay connected on uh, Facebook or other social media. Um, places and I feel like they're family because we've shared things that maybe some things that we've not even shared with our family so I'm so grateful uh, for you Tamika um, we've gotten close uh, through the the months that we worked together and more so because we were in this room I don't think it mattered that we worked together I think it mattered that we came here and uh, began to be close to one another and share things so this room really does mean a lot uh, Miss Marilyn we're so grateful for you and and for having the opportunity to come in and, and uh, be become a sisterhood, which reminds me, I don't know if there's anyone new on the line uh, today. I don't think um, we've acknowledged anyone new. It's cold and most of our members hadn't um, waken up this morning, but if there's anyone new, we welcome you and we're grateful for you. Um, like Ms. Merla said yesterday, I've been, on, been in this room for more than a decade. I, I don't mind speaking. I'm, I probably just not the early morning speaker, but I do love you all. And I love being in this room and I love Miss Marilyn. And, and again, I'm grateful. She promised just one year, she says one year of your life and she'll make a difference, but you have to be consistent and you have to be truthful and, and have your heart and mind open. So uh, we're, as time moves along again, uh, I'm grateful for you to make a thank you for speaking up. Um, <clears throat> before our speakers come on, I know we're getting to the six o'clock hour. I want to think about um, what Ms. Peggy, Peggy and Nancy bring to the group and its family. Our families are important and we want to be able to, I know that I'm really close to my daughter. Uh, we know the uh, scripture, train them up in the way that they should go and they will not depart from it. And I told Hope, I said, I was like Hannah, I said, God, if you give me this baby, and we ended up in Methodist in Dallas two months before she was born, I had to stay total bed rest two 
two months, feet rounded over, and um, I couldn't get out of bed, but I was determined that I was going to let this little baby grow and, and be healthy, and so God did, and I said, I promise I'll give her back to you, and I did, and hope uh, being in the became a youth leader and so God called her into teaching and that was something she never thought she wanted to do. So um, let's stay in the admiration of the Lord, um, ladies, and uh, teach our children the same. Uh, before we uh, bring Ms. Peggy and Nancy in, I want to uh, say a scripture that stays on my mind. Uh, when it comes to uh, the children and family, it's one that we used to say a lot in my family. So if you'll... Um, Lend your ears to me. I'm going to share the scripture before uh, they begin. It says, but Jesus called unto him and said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Verily, I say to you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall no wise enter in. That's from Matthew 9, 14. I uh, accept we have a, a heart of, of like little children where we're forgiven, get mad at each other, and we go back to playing again. Um, if, except we have a heart like that, don't expect to enter into the kingdom. God wants us to give. for He wants us to forgive as he forgives us. And so, ladies, uh, I think we're ready for our speakers, and I thank you for your attention and for your time, and I love you all. Thank you. Miss Marilyn, you want to come in for our speakers? Um, they, they are assigned to keep, to come on in by themselves. So Miss Nancy or Miss Peggy, either one of you guys, we're ready for you. Ready. Good morning, ladies. How are you all doing today? I hope y'all are doing amazing. My ponies are looking kind of off today. I don't know. But anyways, for those of you that are in Texas and that are in the Northeast Texas and the North part of Texas, I hope you guys are staying warm. I hope y'all are staying safe. Um, I hope y'all have electricity because y'all know Texas just be set tripping like we're not ready for this. But um, I wanted to come and talk to you guys today about something. Um, it was a story I was going to share with you guys a little while back, but um, I think this one here hits. It's going to hit home for many people, regardless of the age of yourself, of your children or, or whatever. But um, today I'm going to talk about, of course, adding grace because sometimes um you know, we need to bring it down a notch in order to understand the word of God. We're all God's children. And Adeline is just, um, I have other stories about my other kids. I swear to God, I do. But some of their stories are a little bit more complex sometimes. And it'll take a minute to explain them because they'll tell you mommy gives like long lectures. But I get it from my mama though. My mama used to hold us hostage for like 34 hours and give us these sermons like we were in church, but they were like life you know, inspirational messages. And honestly, until last year, I didn't understand none of them at all. So I hope you guys understand this one here and enjoy it. Um, so it was about maybe, I know exactly what it was. It was the day of uh, the weekend before Martin Luther King's Day. So it would have been the, the 14th, January the 14th, where we're at the house and we're chilling and we're having a good time and everything. And, and Addie is sitting there and she has this obsession with the devil, okay? She has an obsession with God. She has an obsession with the devil. Um, where does it come from? I don't know, but she's she's seven, so she's curious. And so we're sitting there, whatever you know, and she's intrigued by, like, the middle finger, too, you know? Like, I noticed we were taking a picture one time, and she slipped up a finger. It was the ring finger, but it was close enough to the middle finger to where I looked at it. When I took the picture, I really didn't know that this was happening. I swear to God, I didn't know what was happening. And then I look at the photo and I say, what in the world? You know, so I never got a chance to come back around and talk to her, but she did it and she brought up the middle finger. And I said, Addie, I said, what, what, what's your obsession with the middle finger? Do you know what it means? And I explained to her, you know, everything that it means and all this other kind of stuff and whatever, you know. And she goes on and this little girl, y'all, I'm going to tell y'all, like, Addie, she really loves God, y'all. This tells you how pure at heart that even us as adults need to be sometimes. We go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth over, you know, like a series of probably like 15 minutes. I'm explaining to her what the middle finger means, um, that you gotta really be upset with somebody to use it. And at your age, it's really not appropriate. Like you're really not that upset with nobody to use the middle finger at your age. Like nothing that traumatic has happened at seven, I believe. But again, 
I haven't been seven in 30 years. So, you know, some stuff go down the elevator sometimes. So maybe Addie knows something that I don't know. I don't know. So, but um, she was sitting there and she was like, uh, mommy, well, can I use it with the devil? I'm like, why would you want to entertain the devil, Addie? Like, why, 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 why we want to talk to the devil? You know, like, and, and she keeps on going on and on. And she's like, well, he's bad. And he's mean. And she got all these facts at seven. Because Addie goes to like a Christian school. And so they teach her about God. They teach her about God's love, about Jesus. So she pumped up for Jesus. And she knows the devil is a bad guy. And I always let her know that when she's making those bad decisions, baby, you're either making them in love, which is of God, or you're making them of something that's not of love, which that means it's not of God. And if it's not of God, then it's got to be a great representation of Satan. You know what I mean? And also, that's my way of explaining to her that's like her flesh. That's like a fleshy decision. That's not a spiritual decision. But I can't tell Addie, Addie, you can't do that because that's your flesh. Like, she's not going to understand that. So I'm telling her, like, the opposite, you know, because I grew up with, like, uh, watching Family Matters. And they would do, like, little angel and the devil on the shoulders. And that's how I kind of explain things uh, spiritually to Addie. And so she keeps on talking. And I'm just like, Addie, finally, I say, Addie, baby what is it with your like deal with the devil why do you want to like be mean to the devil why do you want to talk to the devil and this baby looks at me pure at heart and I swear to God y'all it was the sweetest thing ever but I really really didn't um yeah I, I just had to tell it was a negative she says mommy but he's gonna be in hell mommy and I don't want the devil to go to hell like True story, I've never in all my years, 37 years, I've never heard anybody on the planet Earth say they don't want the devil to go to hell. Like, like nobody ever, like to me, nobody ever thinks of like bringing the devil out of hell. Like we know he come to Earth and hang out and he trips out with us and, you know, he tries to get us and all this other kind of stuff. But like, I told Addie, I said, Addie, keep on talking to the devil. You're going to be down there with him. Like the time you spend talking to the devil, you're going to be talking to God. You know what I mean? Like, you're trying to convince this man or being that he can get to heaven. So I'm trying to explain to her there's no way possible that Satan can come to heaven. And Addie begins to cry, y'all. Like, again, I ain't never seen nobody cry about the devil being in hell before. But Addie Grace, she, she's very pure hearted to her. That was very uh, that was very moving for her. That was a problem for her. That was an issue for her. At seven years old, this is how pure that these these little children are and so you know they're sponges you know that you can pour anything into them because I could have told her okay Addie well you know be nice to the devil like you know or something but I just literally couldn't in this moment like afford to lie to this child and I told her you know and I said Addie I said you got to stop talking to him I said because the more you talk to him the more time you spend with him the more attention you're giving him okay you're giving him more attention more time more of you Eventually, Addie, you gonna be down there with him hanging out, chilling in the cut. And mommy love you, but sis, I live in Texas. It's too hot for me to go to hell. Like I just, it's just not something I got on my to-do list in the future. I'm just really trying to get into heaven, you know. And and she was sad and everything, you know. And it made me think, you know, we as adults, a lot of times, that's what we do. What we do this with men, we do this with our homegirls, we do this with our family. Like, we intentionally give all of ourselves trying to save people who literally do not even want to be saved. Like, they don't, they can't. Because for the big thing about, the big thing about it is that they don't want to be saved. It's kind of like they saw me, don't save up. She don't want to be saved, don't save up. Like, for real, you have a group of people in life who literally do not want to come out of the conditions and the situations they're in. And we have to understand, like, Addie, that they're not coming out like the people that we're talking to now, yes, they can come out, but they got to come out on their own. We invest so much time with negativity. We spend so much time in our head, even as adults. Like we spend a lot of time entertaining niggas. I was like, if somebody tells us that we're pretty, we're like, no, we not. You want to argue in the gate with somebody giving you a compliment. But if somebody call you ugly, somebody call you a B word, somebody call you anything derogatory, you sit back and you think on it. You know what I mean? You meditate on that word. Why? Why? Why do we not meditate on positivity? Why do we not meditate on prosperity? Why do we not meditate on things that are good and healing to our soul? Like, why don't we talk to ourselves like Addie's trying to talk to the devil, which 
I just hope baby girl you come talk to the devil this morning. She just does some of the strangest stuff. I love her. But it 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 it, it took me to a place because I was like, you know, to hear your kids say they want the devil to go to heaven too. I'm like, you just want him to mess up everybody's life. Like, sis, he already here on earth and you want to bring him up here with us. Like, I'm working hard to get away from him and not knowing. That's what he said. You got to be careful who's praying with you too. You know what I'm saying? And who's praying for your life. Because this seven year old kid of mine is over here trying to get Satan to go to heaven with the rest of us. Like, no, sis, I'm really trying to get away from him, sis. Like, this is just not healthy, sis. But, you know, in her little mind, that meant a lot. And so I want to challenge you guys in reality, like, look at your roster. Like, really, really look at your roster. This is not the season, like, you know, if one of my mentors says, this is not the season of compassion at all. Like, there are so many resources. There are so many opportunities. There's so many outlets. I mean, like, we're in a room virtually online, and there's ladies in here that want to receive help, that want to receive a message, and you present at five something in the morning. You showing up for yourself. That shows initiative. I know some of you ladies have told other women about this place, like, hey, I got this spot, it's lit, I'm telling you, it's fire, like, it's, man, this is the real deal, holy field, like, you know what I mean? You share this message, and yeah, you have get to see their name show up on the list. But when they name show up on your phone, you answer it, and you sit there, and you entertain all of their drama, all of their negativity, and I'm not saying that we don't all need somebody, but at a certain point in time in life, it comes a point where you got to say enough is enough. You know what I mean? You got to have that conversation like, I can't do this, you know? It's like that TV show. Uh, I used to watch a TV show all the time called Intervention, right? I don't know why, but it just intrigued me. So I used to watch Intervention. And one of the statements the counselors used to say to the people, to the families, and say, you got to tell them I can't love you. Really. You know, I can't love you until the end, you know? And we got to start doing that with our friends. We got to start doing that with our family, with our relationships, you know? Like, because even in my marriage, I had to realize that me and my children, we were spiritually dying. Like, we want to praise God. We want to celebrate being, you know, African-Americans. You know, we want to celebrate life. But it was the moment this man walked through the door, everybody's personality completely changed. It was like a dark cloud came over us. And yet I'm still trying to pour into this man. I'm still trying to feed into this man positively, you know. And on the outside, he has the godly image because man... Look, my mama taught me that sometimes, you know, my mom and I got an Amy, her name is Amy Maddie, okay? Amy Maddie, like 75, 76 years old. And Amy Maddie, you know, my mom always say, man, sometimes you got to put Jesus on the shelf. And Amy Maddie say, man, God was doing God before you, so he know what he's doing. If you got to step out of character sometimes, that's just what you got to do. I mean, sometimes you got to set people straight, you know? And we forget that sometimes that even God gets angry. Like, we don't get angry like God. And I explain it to my kids, too, like, don't walk around here thinking that God, God does not get angry. It's what you do when you're angry. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's not the bad thing that you're angry. Emotions, you're going to have them. You're human, totally normal. But what you do when you're angry, and that's what it is. You know what I mean? That that really matters, you know? And so, like, even with your girlfriends, you know what I mean, and your spouses and, and any relationship, if you got somebody that's pouring all this negativity into you that you entertain, like, you're not Jesus. You don't have like on a normal where you can just, you know, like throw them bowls and block this stuff out. Like some of this stuff is going to penetrate to you. And if you listen to the same thing over and over again and something in your spirit just doesn't feel right, you got to speak up. You got to be, you know what I mean? You got to speak up because when you're silenced, that's in blindness. Like you're going along with their life. You're entertaining their life. You're accepting it. Like, no, if you're in somebody's life, you should be there for a reason to make a difference. Not there just because. Now, like Addie, now, I don't know what type of difference she's going to make with the devil, you know, like, I'm actually currently reading a book that's called Outwitting the Devil. I think it's like an interview with the devil or whatever. So, you know what I mean? Because now I had to got me over here intrigued about, like, can Satan, can, can he go to heaven? I hope not, because bro man been starting a little bit too much trouble down here, and I'm just not really in the mood in my next life to be dealing with Satan. I just... I, I just really don't want to. I mean, I just, I don't have the time. I've given him enough time already, you know, like, um, I even tell people, like, it's kind of funny that uh, people listen to me talk about God now, because I can remember there was a time when I was a true thug for Satan, like, you know, I use the word thug because, you know, I taught school, and, you know, all the kids, you know, in high school, I started out teaching high school, so all the kids want to be hard, they want to be gangster, you know, and so I try to use the dialect or whatever, some things are just catchy. 
And, you know, I call myself a hype man for Jesus, you know. Um, people even ask me, man, why do you, you know, like they'll try to give me like names, they'll try to label me, you know, like spiritually, they'll try to say, oh, man, you're an evangelist. Oh, man, you know, you are this. Like, no, name is just name. If Jesus could be just Jesus, name can be just name, you know. I'm a teacher, you know, and I, I, I realize that I've come into my era, like, I've taught in the field of education. I'm very grateful. It was wonderful. I enjoyed it. Uh, very amazing adventure. But I woke up one day and realized that I can't talk about two things that I love most. You know what I mean? Like, I love math. I, I think math is one of the most amazing things. But I can't talk about my God. And if I got to have a job and I can't talk about God, I just kind of really don't want it. Like, I, I don't really care what the consequences and repercussions of that are. And I explained that to my kids as well. Like, um, Libby, Libby is like 14. And I'm telling her, like, baby girl, it's time to start looking for colleges, you know. Like, I asked her when she when she stepped into high school, you know, she's a ninth grader. I was okay with her being in high school until somebody told me she was a freshman. That just didn't sit right with my spirits, that my baby was a, <laughs> my baby was a freshman. And so I said, Libby, I need you to pick out a cemetery. I need you to pick out a branch of the military. I need you to pick out a college and I need you to pick out a trade school. And she's like, huh? A cemetery? Yeah, baby, because if you don't choose one of them first, you know, the other three options, death is definitely an option for you because we just not going to be out here living life with no purpose. You know what I mean? Like I have to give her the same threats my mama gave me because I turned out okay. You know, a lot of times we think some of the harshness that our parents have said to us, you know, um, it, 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 it was just a little too much. But I don't know if y'all met these new kids, like the way our parents talk to us, like that's, that's who need to be talking to this new generation for real. Like I completely entrust my mom with my kids, like faithfully, because these kids out here, they are literally like, if you want to say born of sin, they're a perfect example of what sin looks like. Anything sinful, they all about it, you know. And it's just the same thing that we used to do as a kid, but it's just, you know, like through social media and technology, it's magnified, you know what I mean? like the lights and everything is on them, you know, like things they do, like back in the day, like a text message for us was like writing a letter. And if the letter ever got torn up, you know, I mean, like it's no more, like unless somebody could remember it verbatim, which was very rare, or unless somebody was cool enough to go get the notebook you wrote it in and the shade it or something like that, you know what I mean? They couldn't really figure out what it was, you know? But like nowadays it's snapshots and screenshots, you know, and stuff like that. And so, I try to tell her, you know, like, Lydia, you got to make wise decisions, baby girl. You can't, you got to think, you know, you're at the age where you got to think, you got to make decisions. But the decisions you make today is really going to affect your tomorrow, you know. And Lydia, she struggles and she's very mature. Um, spiritually is where we kind of struggle a little bit. Like, Lydia Grace, you can put her in a room full of grown ups. And other than looking at her baby face, you kind of can't tell, you know what I mean? Because she can hang with the best of them, you know. She's very well-versed, she's very knowledgeable, she's very well-experienced, you know. She knows it, like, she's super nosy. Like, sis is, like, she wants to be a private eye. I'm going to support her in that dream because I'm telling you, sis is going nationwide because she knows everybody's business but her own, you know. And I have to talk to her about that. I have to say, Libby, you know everybody else's story. You know everybody else's testimony, everybody else's drama. But do you know your own? You spend so much time talking about other people, what other people are doing, what other folks are doing. Baby, what is you doing in real life? What are you doing with your life? You know what I mean? And you got a lot of grown-ups, you know, you got a lot of grown women out here. And we know everybody else's business, but we don't know our own. We don't know how to solve our own problems. And see, that used to be me. That's us deflecting, taking care of our own responsibilities, even spiritually, you know what I mean? Like, we, oh, she go to, like, we don't know everybody else's story. People aren't going to tell you what portion of them they want you to know. You know what I mean? And so we don't know what they've been through. We don't know what they're going through. I try to explain this to my child because I'm like, baby, like you keep on hanging out. She went to this school and she kept on hanging out with the same group of girls. And every year stuff will go down the elevator and the only person that's in trouble was her. And I was like, sis, this seems to be a repeated pattern. Like you ain't, I mean, am I missing something? Or you, I mean, like, let's have a conversation. Let's have a come to Jesus meeting, you know? And I wanted to sit down to know what was going on with my child, what's going on up in here. Because you're making the same decisions, baby, and you're the only one getting caught. So first of all, the first thing you need to know is being a criminal, probably not a good option for you. You can just cut that off your bucket list. Doing something wrong, because you always get caught, you know? I mean, and then like, you know, these little girls you're hanging with, why they not in trouble? Because they all getting together throwing you under the bus. 
But yeah, you constantly tell me how you help them, how you pour into them, how they they going through this and they going through that and you talking to them. All of a sudden, now you're a licensed therapist at 13, 14 years old. Like, I didn't know you could do that, but apparently now they can. So, you know, I, I, I try to teach her, you know, the same thing, you know, like with Addie, you know, like I try to teach my kids, stay in your lane, worry about yourself. Like Addie Grace, she gets tired of me saying it, but I'll say Addie Grace. Um, who are we worrying about in 2023 and beyond? And she'll hold her head down and she'll say, Addie. I'm like, no, you hold your head over pride, baby girl, because there's nothing wrong with worrying about yourself. We've been taught, you know, like as women that we can't worry about ourselves. My seven-year-old daughter thinks it's a bad thing to worry about herself. Like my mama taught me self-preservation come first, you know? And then I grow up and say, pig don't know what she's talking about. I'm going to go out here and worry about everybody else's business, right? And I'm going to get confused with everybody else's problems, right? And I'm going to go out here and solve everybody else's problems. And yet I was suffering and I was dying myself on the inside. You know what I mean? And so I want to say like, yeah, if you got girlfriends, you got a husband, a boyfriend, a maid, a girlfriend, whatever, because in America, you can have whatever you want now, baby. You know, whatever it is, worry about yourself. Take care of yourself. Make sure that you do some self-care. Worry about what's going on with you. Because again, like with Addie, you love worrying about the devil. That ain't going to benefit you. You can spend that time, you know, doing underwater basketball. You need to talk to God, you know. You need to talk to the positive things about yourself, you know. And so, like, she get these colors and stuff at school. And so I encourage her, Addie, today we're going for a green. She'll come home with a yellow and say, Mommy, yellow is good. And I have to hit her with what this principal told me. If better is possible, maybe the good is not enough. We have to continue to challenge ourselves. And that's how you challenge your kids, you know. Like, I, I go over my day every night, every evening. Nan, what were the highs? What were the lows of your day? And whatever the highs were, you ain't got to worry about the highs. You don't have to worry about your strength. You know what I'm saying? But we focus on things that we're good at. We never focus on things that we're bad at. You know what I mean? Like, if you messing up, like, for me, relationships. Um, I, I used to always say, you know, I could have a perfect life. I can't have relationships with people. Like, I'm horrible with people. But I didn't spend enough time, you know. And, and I look back now at 37 years old. And some days I catch myself want to sit in regret. And I say, man, you got to get out of it. Because while you're sitting here sitting in regret, you could actually pick up the phone and call those people and talk to them. You know what I mean? They've forgiven you. God has forgiven you. Let's keep moving because we serve a moving God. We don't serve a stagnant God, you know. And we got to remember that, that everything that we're doing, like, all I did with Addie Grace was I reshifted shifted her attention. Like, she wanted to talk. She wanted to talk to the devil. I had to tell her, baby, you got to talk to God. You got to go with God. Like, I... It's all about redirecting. Even as adults, we have to redirect ourselves all the time. Like, I call it auto correct. When my kids do something that I've been preaching for them to do, and they do it, I say, look at you auto correcting, baby. Because I auto correct myself. I don't challenge my kids to do anything that I won't do myself, you know? I won't challenge my kids or tell my kids because as a parent, I too once lived by do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> Why? Like, and then we wonder why these kids run around here doing stuff they do. Like, you, you can't do that because kids are going to watch you. Like, you can tell them, go jump off a bridge, but if you ain't jumping, they ain't going to jump either. You know, and I tell my kids, like, we 10 toes down, and so we 40 toes deep. So whatever anybody is in, we're all there. We're all supported. Like, Addie Grace, she has, like, her team, you know. But Addie, I love her, but Addie is a center of attention child. So anytime we got to go support somebody else, Sisters, like, I don't understand why I'm not up there. You know, like, we went to go, y'all, we went to go see this Olympian, right? We went to go see this Olympian uh, swimmer. And Addie Grace has a question, you know, she's like, she wants to ask a question because at, at her school, they encourage the kids to speak, to ask questions. So <laughs> her brother is sitting by her, and I'm back there taking some photos, you know, and stuff. And they didn't have seats, so I wasn't going to sit on the floor. I was kind of cute that day. I just wasn't going to sit on the floor at this gym. So he says, go ask mommy, go ask mommy. So, so Addie comes over and she says, mommy, I got a question. I'm like, yes, like, I'm super excited about anything positive that my kids want to do. Even if it's negative, like, I just do like on five heartbeats. I just got to show how to use everything she got, you know. So Addie comes over and she says, mommy, I got a question. I said, Addie, what's your question? And she says, I want to tell her, she said she got a sister. I want to let her know I got a sister and a brother. And she swim. I'm a cheerleader. I do gymnastic. I mean, and sis go on and on about all the stuff she's doing. And I go, Addie, where's the question? She said, that was the question. Addie, baby, that's not a question, sweetie. 
that's that's <laughs> sweetheart. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but mommy cannot let you get up here and raise your hand and say this. So instead of shutting her down completely, I say, okay, Addie, I begin to sit down and I think of a question a seven-year-old can ask, right? So she's so excited. And I'm thinking of a question that Addie is like, she's so excited. Like, she's like, I got to raise my hand. I got to raise my hand. And I swear sometimes my child is probably really ADD, but I'm just not going to medicate her on all of that. She just has uh, moments where her attention span is just too excited for that little body. And that was one of them, you know, because she's like, this woman talking about what she do. Let me tell sis how good I am and what I do. Matter of fact, I'm a shoulder. I can do flip. I can do this and all this other stuff. And so Addie gets over there and I raise my hand for her. And, you know, another little kid gets to go and Addie's like, come on, sis, I'm supposed to be next. You know what I'm saying? She's very impatient. And we have to realize, too, as adults, that a lot of times we're very impatient, too, you know. And we have to teach our kids patience, you know. And so, find the lady come over, and she uh, asked Addie, like, what's your question, right? So, I gave Addie a question. Like, to this day, I can't even remember what I told this little girl to ask because, like, they moved Addie away from me. And they gave Addie Grace a microphone <laughs> by herself in a room full of people. And if you know my child, like you can understand why it was cold outside, but I was sweating bullets because she got up there and she was like, <laughs> uh, and I'm like, oh Lord, what is this baby about to say? Like, they probably got the news media here, folks taking pictures, people is everywhere. Like, I'm nervous. I'm like so nervous. I'm nervous than she is, right? And she gets up there. And um, she asked this lady, she asked her um, a question, something around about uh, why do you, what makes you enjoy swimming as much as you do? Like, why do you enjoy swimming? Or what made you enjoy swimming? Something like this, right? Which was like, I mean, by the time it came out of my mouth, like, I was like, thank God, because I just knew she's been telling this woman, like, you only got a sister, sis. I got a sister and a brother, and they older. And Addie got attitude, she got neck. I mean, she got a whole lot of stuff going on in that little bitty body. And she gets up here and she asks this question, whatever, you know. And everybody is, you know, like, yay, you know. I mean, and she did really well. She gets up and she introduces herself. And I was very impressed. You know, you'd be amazed, like, what happens to your kids when you, like, give them a little space. You know what I mean? So we can't, like, helicopter them. But, you know, give them a little space. Because the first thing Addie Grace does is, I mean, like, it's her mom, like, she'd be giving me, like, a lot of proud parents. But all my kids, so Addie gets up there and she tells them, hi, my name is Addie, or she says, my name is Adeline, and I'm seven years old, and I attend school at Promise Academy, and I'm like, sis, is represent for the 9-9 nine, nine and 2,000 kids, like, I'm here for it, I'm here for it, and what's this question you about to ask, baby, so I get nervous, you know, we have to, we have to trust that our kids are going to do what we know they're going to do, we know what they're capable of doing, and she, in turn, created her own question, had nothing to do with what her mama said, like, nothing, Addie, if she can do it independently, she's going to do it, you know. And so we have to give our kids the tools they need to be independent because we're not going to always be with them. We can't always protect them. We can't always shield them. Like, I'm currently in a situation now where I almost had a nervous breakdown myself yesterday because <laughs> I wake up and see, like, mm, Texas. Oh, my God. I'm just a little distance from my kids. Not too far, but I'm far enough to where I can't slide into East Texas. You know what I'm saying? So. I went into straight paranoia, you know, I really did, because when your whole life is in a place and you can't, you can't, um, you can't get to them, and even if you can get to them, there's nothing to do, because I'm like, mommy got power, because I got the power of Jesus Christ in me, but uh, mommy ain't got no electricity in her, like, I just, like, I ain't have no X-Men type powers, no Wolverine, no, I ain't got them, you know what I'm saying, I ain't got the people in the storm, like, I don't have the people, and so I had to go into a place of, God had a conversation with me yesterday. This probably has nothing to do with what we were talking about. But before I get off, I'm going to share this with you. Find, even when you find your purpose, you got to find your why. You know, and this is something I'm working on because I'm going to teach my kids this next. But y'all are adults. I think y'all can handle this. So I'm going to let y'all go with this. But God had to show me because in less than probably three weeks, what I consider my life, my reason for breathing, you know, because up until Addie Grace was born, I literally was the most suicidal person on the planet. Real true story. Like, I used to pray to God at night. God, if you could just take me tonight, that would just be glorious. Like, if you could just, I mean, from the age of 10, I can remember saying a prayer like, God, please kill me tonight. Because that's how much I hated, like, life. I didn't want to be here. There was no purpose for me to be here. 
And October 20th of 2015, God gave me a reason to breathe. You know what I mean? He gave me a reason to, you know, he breathed life into me through another life, you know? And so she is my promise for, for like so many reasons. She, she gave me a reason to live because I want to cry. But before Addie, I didn't want to live. And like now, it's like God don't take me because I want to see her live. I want to see Libby live. I want to see Gabe live. I want to see their children live, you know? You never really know what people are going through because many people for many years never knew that Nan was depressed, suicidal. You know, you never know what people are going through. But God showed me that, yeah, for seven years, the number seven is, you know, the number of completion, you know, and Addie is seven, you know, I've been a parent for seven years. And it's like, okay, Nan, now you're breathing. Now you're doing good, baby. But now you got to find your why. Because two or three weeks ago, me and my kids had a bad car accident on a Saturday. We were on our way to uh, on our way to the house to change to go to a um, like a little concert or whatever, right? And we were so excited. And me and my kids got hit by a 1985. Like I don't care what kind of car you in there, but you get hit by a 1985 Oldsmobile, you gonna feel it. You know what I'm saying? Like in real life, you gonna feel it. You know. And so like my son, you know, he he braced himself. He sprung his ankle. He braced his arm. You know, I don't know why he locked his feet under the seat. <laughs> Bless his heart. Baby ain't never had a car wreck before, but. He hurt his, you know, his ankle, his, his arm, Addie Grace hurt her neck, you know, Libby Grace sprained her arm, you know, me, I hurt my back, you know, and, and, and I'm sitting up here like, you know, we walked out, you know, we went to the hospital, we walked out, and I was like, thank God, I woke up that morning, and it was like five or six o'clock in the morning, and a friend had called me and prayed for me, and I immediately got up, and I went and laid hands and prayed over my children, because that could have been a totally different outcome, and then here we are, you know, Yesterday, you know, all, you know, excuse me, like, all hell breaking loose in Texas. And I'm like, not in that part of Texas where my kids are, or my mother, and the electricity is out and it's storming. And I am mortified because I'm a protector. You know what I mean? I'm a mathematician, so I solve problems. And I wasn't able to do that. And so God said, man, you got to find your why. Because people, tangible things cannot be your why. What you're doing, what you're doing. Yeah, they're the reason why you work and make money. But why is your mission with me? Why, 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 why are you going to fulfill your purpose or your destiny with me, man? Like you got to have something rooted in you. And so I want to challenge you ladies to, to look over your life and ask yourself your why. If you found, or you're working on your purpose, um, you're working in your flow with God, find your why. And it cannot, I'm telling you, I'm giving you a little tip and this is for free. Okay. Your tip cannot be anything tangible. It cannot really be a person. Um, it really can't even be you, you know what I mean? Because you will fail yourself. And like to wake up to hear that, like, y'all don't understand the devastation on my heart that I was like, my whole life is together in one vehicle trying to stay warm. Like that just hit Nan in a place that just like an uppercut, you know? But um, find your why. Um, stop talking to the devil. Talk more to God. Um, the negativity that you hear from other people, you got to say no. You got to learn to say no and cut it off. And you got to be real for people. And uh, I think that's my time. So if you ladies have any questions or anything like that, um, I'm here for it, sis. I'm here for it. Good morning. Wonderful job, Nan. And, and I know you are pressing through, especially with mom and the babies going through, you know, that little, I don't know if it's an ice storm in Tyler or just the wet, the, uh, the electricity's out, but um, thank you so much for pressing through this morning. Uh, Mom is still having just a few internet issues. I'm not quite sure if she's dropped on, but she just texted a few minutes ago and uh, look like she's on now, but I know she's probably going to be uh, kind of in and out because her internet is not working properly. Uh, so we're gonna let you kind of continue on. Uh, we're gonna let everybody come in. If you guys would have you know, questions and you know, thoughts about things, uh, we'd love for you guys to you know, kind of join into conversation so that we can uh, just continue on with our family talk time. Uh, one of the things that I will say, uh, Nan, I love the way uh, that the Lord is is uh, pushing you through parenthood, you know, and you're finding the joy um, even in the midst of teaching and training and, you know, so much more. You're also finding out a lot about yourself. And I just want to ask you something, you know, I know, uh, I don't know about y'all, but raising kids, um, raising kids is is somewhat of a reflection of us going back in time even with ourselves, 
you know, we get a chance to slow down and, you know, God, he, he, he's so majestic in what he does. Raising children gives us an opportunity to slow down and really reassess things that we may have done in life, you know, and, and, and it's like, uh-uh, not that, that was what I was trying to do right there, you know, but, and we get an opportunity to show the children, you know, maybe a more excellent way with that. Uh, what would you say, uh, Nan, has been your, your biggest lesson or your biggest kind of aha moment when it came down to raising children? I think you are mute. Um, understanding and realizing that they have their own brains from day one. Um, Addie, of course, was a newborn. Um, and so she is my, my full on throttle. She's at the age of where I receive my other two children now. So I've got to experience, you know, zero through, you know, from birth through all the way up, you know, Addie was seven days old. Um, that's pretty strange. All my kids came at the number seven. She was seven days old and the other two were seven. But understanding that even as a child, Addie has always had her own mind, regardless of what I wanted her to do, regardless of what I wanted to prevent her from doing. And, you know, like having to allow her to make mistakes because I realized I was sheltered a lot. So I grew up in a lot of things. I went out in the real world. And it was a lot different than what my mom, you know, had told me it was, you know, yeah. she kind of sheltered us, you know, and so I don't shelter my kids as much. And I notice they keep on doing the same thing over and over again. I remember me as a kid, I did it until I found out that it wasn't a good idea. And so like my mom, sometimes she'll get upset because I'll look at the kids like, okay, I'm a little find out. Like, you want to keep doing it, do it because you're a human and you're not going to learn until you decide to learn. And I try to not take away from who they are as an individual. I try to embrace it. Like I say, oh, dude, off the five, Barbie, I try to use everything they got. Um, and then, of course, with my kids um, having different backgrounds a little bit and me not knowing some of their history, yeah. um, you know, it makes it a little challenging sometimes. But at the same time, I can't say it's that challenging because I've taught, I don't know how many thousands of kids and I made it with them. So if I can make it in a classroom with kids, I can definitely make it home with those kids. But understanding that each child is different, each mm -hmm. child needs something different, and mm -hmm. you may have a parenting style of a base, but mm -hmm. it's got to be versatile for that kid. It's got to be customized for that child. Because the same way that I talk to Libby, I don't necessarily talk to Addie like that sometimes. Because Addie, Addie is just like me. Like Addie will stand up and look at me and tell me, like she told me the other day, I was getting on her sister. And I heard at the same time, that's okay, Eddie, mommy's done with you. And Eddie told me, uh -uh, I'm going to watch you talk to my sister because you're not going to talk to my sister any kind of way. You know, and not scolding her for that, you know what I mean? But honoring who she is, you know, because some people say, dang, that's a disrespectful kid. But that's going to be a very virtuous, powerful young lady. Like, she's a strong-willed child. And she's going to be able to stand up for herself. Mm -hmm. You know, she can stand up to her mom because I always tell my kids, if mommy's wrong, checkmate me. Don't let me go out here and be wrong because we're, even on your mom, we brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I do wrong too. Like I even apologize to my kids, you know, when I'm wrong because I need them to know that mommy's a human too, that I make mistakes and I try to show them that. But the hardest thing is really accepting the individuality, accepting the fact that they got their own brain. That's right. And I got to look at them like when Addie going up and holding their mic and what she was going to say. Like that was, that, yeah, because Addie, you never know what she's going to say. Like you never know what she's going to say. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I think that's one of the major challenges that we have, you know, especially when we're a lot younger uh, with our children was uh, trying to find out who that particular child was. You know, especially when you have uh, multiple children, you know, they don't have the same personality. And then you're dealing with uh, something totally different from that. Uh, your children are not, they don't have the same DNA, nor do they have your DNA. So it's not like, yeah, it's not like you can follow to say, oh, they, you know, they got behavior like mom or they got behavior like whatever. You're really discovering uh, what uh, love is. Y'all, I've got this little phrase. I have been using this thing. God gave me this the other night and I just can't let it go. Uh, it has a lot to do with uh, with love. Uh, I'm going to see if I can get back to it. And um, God said, love runs deeper 
than the heart of our imagination. Mm. It runs deeper. It take a minute to think about it. It runs deeper than the heart of our imagination. You know, meaning um, I can understand when the scripture talk about what level of love, what manner of love is this, that a man will lay down his life for his friend. Love goes very, very deep. And especially when we have been born again, uh, the way we love is so different than what we did before. Um, you know, I think about parenting, um, you know, when I was a lot younger and uh, I parent totally different than I, what I did before. You know, it's almost like when the scripture says, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I behaved like a child. But when, when I became a full adult, I had to put away those types of behaviors. And um, I often have this phrase, uh, the one that rocks the cradle rules the world. And so a lot of times when I want to see uh, the major changes in my children, I had to learn this. I made the change with me. Amen. And then I understood what the scripture said. Oh, the one that rocks the cradle rules the world. And if you ever want to see change with them, started with you. You ever want to see your house calm down or order come in the house? Don't try to get it in the children. Start it with you. Yes. Start, start picking up stuff, start cleaning up things. They're going to notice it, you know? And it's kind of like that that mother uh, uh, chick, chick, chicken or whatever, and her little chicklets just follow her, whatever she does, they do. And it's a mystery. That's why I say love, it runs deeper than the heart of our imagination. Sometimes you have to imagine what love looks like, especially if you've not had an example of what it is, you got to imagine what love would look like and then dare to go there, dare to go there yourself. And you're going to reproduce after whatever it is that you see within your heart. And it can run so deep that it's like, I didn't know I could love like that. Yeah. I didn't know I could forgive like that. I know I can look at man like that, you know, but that's, that's the heartbeat of God that does that, you know, and I know, uh, Nan, we're going to get ready to turn it over to her mom in just a little bit. Um, I know that you are transitioning in a new city. Um, and I think is one of the babies still here or is everyone with you now? No, they're, they're all with my mom. She they're said you can not take one without taking the other. So. You can't, okay, okay. <laughs> so even that phase of parenting, you know, when you're in a different city or um, leaving them in the hands of others, um, it, that, that has to be a transition within itself, trying to get things together for them. What they say, what manner of love is this that my mom would even keep my kids while yeah. I am um, rediscovering life. And then what matter of love is this that my mom has that she's trying to make a better life for us and she's preparing a way for us. It's a deep, it's, it's what you're doing is deeper than your imagination. <laughs> it really yeah. is. And I'm saying that Nan, because uh, you and your mom uh, Y'all do remind me so much of me and my daughter. Um, when Jordan, uh, my daughter is Jessica and my granddaughter is Jordan. Uh, in Jordan's fifth grade year, uh, Jessica had been talking about moving for the longest. You know, uh, every city is not for every child. You know, right. they uh, they don't always flourish in those areas. But I remembered when we uh, moved to Dallas the first time, the first person that flourished in this area was Jordan. I'm not Jordan, Jessica. Jessica found friends like she had never found friends in Tyler. You know, oh my gosh, she just, she just, she just changed so much. And when we went back to Tyler, it was like it almost ruined her. She was like, we going back to this dungeon. That was in her heart. Yeah. See, because she didn't have the same experiences that I had, you know, but as a mother, I'm trying to make the best decisions because it wasn't just about Jessica, about Jessica. There were other children and I had to find a safe place for all of them. And I'll never forget when Jessica made up her mind and said, I'm an adult now and I'm going to do it on my own. 
but she was, but Jordan didn't want to go just yet. Jordan was in the fifth grade. And uh, we made a decision to allow Jordan, uh, many of the ladies on the line remember that, uh, we made a decision to let Jordan stay with me. She stayed with me her fifth grade year. And uh, often people would say, um, you know, they would have their own thoughts about it or whatever. But my thoughts are me and my family, we do life God's way. Amen. We don't do life the way everybody else does. It. And if my daughter needs a fresh start. I don't want my, my, I don't want my granddaughter in that just yet. I want her to get settled first. And, uh, but believe me, when May came of that year, Jordan, no, I had to start preparing her in April. Jordan, start packing up your clothes. Mom is coming to get you the day school is out, you know? And uh, Jordan, boy, she was, oh no, granny, cause she had developed friends there. And it took a minute when Jordan left uh, to get her bearings in this new city because she loved Tyler so much. But after a while, she got there, I ain't going back. Yeah. She's not going back. And, and just a little bit, because I don't know if I just want to ease your heart this morning and ease mom's heart to let y'all know that uh, things will work out. They will work out very well. Um, Jordan has a level of confidence within her of love uh, because we did shelter her, you know? So I hear you when you say uh, mom provided a level of shelter around y'all that, you know, maybe it didn't give you an opportunity to experience the world, but that was the reason for the shelter. We had already experienced enough, you know, for <laughs> you guys. But let me tell you how it is paying off. Uh, my daughter is 35 years old now. And there are some things that are going on around with their peers and I've heard all three of them come back to say, but mama, we missed that. We didn't go through that. Mm -hmm. And all I could think about was they didn't understand it while I was doing it, but they understand the reason now. Yeah. And then I look back because we're trying to set up a whole new legacy, whole new breaking generational things. My, my granddaughter has gone to college now. And she's at, she's at Prairie View. And uh, one of the teachers tried to talk down to her the other day. And Jordan has no reference of people talking down to her at all, not at all. She has such a repellent to that, uh, to where when the teacher said something uh, to try to put her down, uh, Jordan rejected it so well, but she fought for what she wanted. The lady wanted to put her out of a class because Jordan didn't talk. Jordan doesn't talk much. She doesn't do this and that. And, uh, and Jordan fought all the way uh, to get back in the class to prove that she had been in that class. The lady was saying she wasn't in the class, but to prove she was in the class. And we got a message from Jordan yesterday that says, I decided not to do her. <laughs> and when I tell you we were so proud of her, she said, that's a stress that I can do without because that lady is gonna pick on me now. And she said it, I don't have the energy for that. And when all, when I tell you all of us talked about it yesterday, we were saying job well done, Jordan. You do not have to put up with people, even of your same color, putting yeah. you down. But if we had kept her in environments where, or put her in environments where people were able to talk ugly to her, she wouldn't have had a resistance to some of those things. So what am I saying? A lot of times things that we do, we do them unknowingly. What they say, love runs deeper than the heart can imagine. Mm -hmm. I'm going to protect you from anything that anybody has tried will try to do to you because there should be a repellent immediately on you to say, you can get somebody else to do that. That part. I'm not going to sit in your class. I'm not, a, I'm not gonna sit on the front row. So for you to pick on me and I have you Monday, Wednesday and Friday in a class. And I think that if a lot of people would choose, if parents would even teach your children to by example, uh, to have a strong sense of wellness, a strong mm -hmm. sense of love. When others try to come and put you down, you will have no reference of that. Exactly. And what we don't have reference to we don't answer to. So I'm I'm in the trenches praying with you. 
because uh, I've, I've been there. I've been on, I'm on the other side of that. And we got a college graduate now. Amen. amen. Even with mom making that major decision. And it has been the best uh, decision. Jessica's been shielded from a lot. She knows nothing about uh, what true single parenting is about. She's She's been a single parent, but she really don't know nothing about real uh, single parenting. Yeah, she really does goodness. not. Y'all feel some of it, but when you got a parent around you, you really don't know what single parent is about. You don't know what single parent is about until nobody is there. Therefore. Absolutely nobody is there. So just know that we're praying for you, Nancy, and um, it's gonna be a smooth transition. Um, I would say wait on God's peace with every step of the way. Um, find Nancy again, mm -hmm. life after divorce. Find Nancy, you know, take a moment to breathe. You need that. You owe that to yourself. And uh, when you come out, you don't have to explain anything to anybody, not anybody, except for God. It was good for me that I was afflicted. I learned yeah. some things about myself. Amen. I did. I learned. I learned what your grandbaby learned. I learned it as an adult, but I already, always knew it as a child. My mom instilled a lot of things in me, but when I went out there in the world, um, I thought my mama didn't know what she was talking about. You know what I mean? I, I thought my mama didn't know what she was saying, and I thank God for her because I'm still standing today because of her, and so. Even in here, when I listen to some of the other women in their relationships and not understanding their mother, um, not understanding your mother means you also don't understand a part of who you are. You're not honoring a piece of who you are. And, you know, to encompass such, my mom is a very large woman in real life. Like, she's a big, big woman, you know. Uh, but to, I guess in a sense, running from myself, or rejecting my mother or whatever, but I was running from that major piece of me that I really needed that my mom always knew I had, but I didn't want to acknowledge because I could hear the chatter about the things that people would say about my mom. And I, I wanted to be normal. I wanted to be accepted. And then going through my divorce, I had to share some things with my with both of my parents that, I mean, I never really, I mean, I plan on taking that stuff to the grave with me, you know, but I had to open up and I'm very grateful um, for doing that because that broke a barrier that I didn't know I had for many, many years with my mom. Like I would come and tell my mom some stuff. And I mean, my mom would look me dead in the face and say, Nan, babe, I can tell you some stuff that that would tear up everything you just told me. You know, uh, baby, that ain't that. You know, it was nothing. And my mom showed me that there was nothing, baby, that you can do. The same thing I tell my daughter, you know, because I tell Libby, I said, Libby, there's nothing you can do that's so horrible that mommy would stop loving you, that mommy's going to stop being there for you. And it's one thing to hear, it, but it's a totally different thing to see it because when you see it, you really truly believe it. Like, I mean, I did some stuff, you know, that honest to God, truth, you know, just, I mean, most parents would have just been appalled. Now. The only thing my mom, you know, really looked at me differently about was some of the things that she heard that the grandchildren experienced when they were away from even me, when they were with their dad. I heard my daddy both looking at me like, soon we get up out of here, you will have a talk because you're not even keeping the great kids, you know what I mean? And so I am so grateful for the type of mom that I have because I tell people like, my mom is my co-parenter and she's the greatest co-parenter, you know, um, to even go through a divorce. Like my parents, if you were to see them and my mom has been married for years now, her and her husband, you know what I mean? I, hey, I love Tim, he's a great guy, you know what I mean? But people still to this day think my parents, you know what I mean? Like, if they meet me and they meet my parents, they think my parents are still married because to this day, my parents don't miss a beat for me. Like, even through my divorce, going downtown, you know, my parents, they was both there. And then my mama did the talking, but my daddy was there, you know, whatever Peggy <laughs> said, whatever Peggy said, you know. And I thought that I would have that as well, you know, and um, with, with my ex and you know, a lot of times we, we look for certain people to do certain things and to be in certain places. You have it. It may not look like what you want it to look like, but you have it. And I had it all along. Like, I had it in my mom. Like, to, for my kids to go back into the school year, like, I had to, I had, because I'm that one kid my mama tell you, 
Nan is not going to ask for help. Like Nan is going to struggle. She's going to figure it out. She's going to thug it out. I'm not going to come ask you because I know how hard my mom works for her money. You know what I mean? And I know my mom is always taking care of me, you know? Like at the age of 11, you know, I haven't asked my dad for a dollar since I was 11 years old because I asked him for $20. Like, bro, you only got to pay $20 a week for lunch. And you can't do that. And as an 11 year old kid, I told my daddy, I said, I can get more than $20 from a man. That's okay. You ain't never got to give me another dime. I never went to my mom again and asked her, hey, mom, you know, because I didn't get free lunch because my mom always worked. So I didn't, I didn't go to my mom and say, mom, let me have some money so I can eat lunch. But I ate and I ate good every day, you know, all the way through school. You know, I always figured it out. And I've always been that kid. And until I became a parent, I, I never tapped into it. And even now, um, I tapped into my mom at 37, not because I needed her, but because my children needed her. I love my kids so much that I don't care what other people think. Like, people are honestly mad at me because I'm using my own mom. Like, y'all yeah, had access to big my whole life. I've shared my mom with you my whole life. And one season, I need my mom. Like, I literally need her. You're mad. What is that's your problem, you know? Because I called my mom one day because I heard some stuff, you know, from different people. So I, I was I was not in the city with my mama. Trust me, I'm 37. I'm still scared of my mama. So I called her and I'm like, so my, is this something we need to talk about? You know, like, are you telling people this, this, this? She was like, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And then all of a sudden that Peggy comes out. She was no longer my mama. She's like, if you're going to run up on me like a grown woman, I'm going to treat you like a grown woman. Because if I got something to say about you, man, I'm going to say it to your face. Baby, I ain't said nothing about you, so don't come and be like that, you know? And she began to talk to me and tell me, this is why people are feeling this way. She says, man, when you're going through stuff, and, and, and people don't understand, she says, man, I don't tell people where you at. I don't tell people what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I don't they make up stuff. Them. Yeah, she said, I just let them assume. And she said, so they coming to you with assumptions, baby. And I always told you this, you make an assumption to make an A out of you and them both. And I said, okay. And that was the moment that I knew my mom was on my team. Like, I knew... I had my mom one career I'd always had my life because I just wanted my mama. And I go freely now. Like my mom knows every move that I make. My mom knows everything that I do, good or bad, right or wrong. And she supports me. And that's why I tell my oldest, baby, if you tell me what you're doing, I'll know what you're doing. So at least you got a defense mechanism to protect mm -hmm. you. But if mama don't know, mama can't protect what she don't can't know. Protect you. Mm -hmm. You know, and so going through what I went through, you know, like. I mean, I got people that my mom has helped, you know what I mean, for years. I got people that my mom offered the same thing she offered me. And you thought she was trying to take your kid or you thought she was trying to raise your kid her way or whatever, you know? And then you got people that's like, because I don't, like, I rarely, like, get into a bind where I'll take my, I need to shoot some money if I do. I literally shoot it back to her the same day, if not two or three days later, mm -hmm. because I know how hard my mama worked and my mom had my kids and I can survive off of less. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I try not to take anything from her, but people will make assumptions like me trying to rebuild my life, start my life. Like majority of my family live in the state of Texas, always have, always will. And mm -hmm. I assume, you know, and like they think I'm rude because I'll tell them, I'm like, y'all still stuck in the South. Y'all don't know that Texas is free. Like they can't even let us free. We can leave the state, you know. And my mom, one thing she told me going through my divorce, she was like, man, I'll never I'll never tell you, you know, my mom told me that this city is big enough for the both of y'all. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to go, baby, if you don't want to stay here, baby, I support you in whatever you do. And it's a roster of people that's mad because my mom support me and wanted to be me because I told my mom, I said, mom, for 37 years, I went from your house into a house with a man and I've done everything that everybody wanted me to do. I have yet to even know what I want to do. And yeah. my mom has given me a chance to know what I want to do, know what I like, know what I don't like, know what I love, know what I don't love, you know, um, a moment to just find me again. So her with my kids, you know, like we all bundle up and, you know, I'm like, hey, I shut my house down. Hey, I'm going home to mom. We all going to bed, you know, like we getting me and my kids in the bed together. But for my mom to support me in this season, it, it, I can't explain, you know, and a lot of women don't understand that if they were yeah. more open with yeah. their mom, you will receive the same thing. Because if you got a mama who's good to everybody, mm -hmm. you got to know how grander she's going to be to you. And I've always just had a resistance with my mom, you know? Like, I never thought that my mom, because my mom's always let me figure stuff out. But that's because 
that's what I wanted to do. So if I wanted to bump my head, pig say, well, go on out there, man. You're going to go all the way around the city <laughs> and find out all the food and tile on Broadway. Go on out there. You know, it's just say, man, you got to go all the way around the world. And I woke up one day and I said, I'm tired. That was the notion of me getting tired of myself. I had to get sick of me before I made a change. And I got tired of going all the way around this. I've been in Thailand my whole life. I left, I came back. All the food still, all the good food is still on Broadway. It's a true story. Mm-hmm. So I don't, you know what I mean? So that tells me that, man, trust your mama. And at the same time, that allowed me to transition my trust to trust God even more. You mm-hmm. know, because if my mom is leaning on God. You don't think that your mama leaning on God. You don't think you can lean on him too. He big enough for the both of you, you know? That's right. And and I didn't know that my mom, like, I mean, this is a true story. Like, I thought my mom was, like, because she's such a realist, you know, I didn't know my mom knew God, like, the way she knew God. You know, like, I got older and I knew, but becoming a single parent myself, which, yeah, you're right. I'm really not a single, single parent. Cause, That's like, right. That's if right. You got, hey, if you got your mom on your team, hey, mm-hmm. you're totally not a single parent. You barely mm-hmm. even a parent in real life if you want to know the truth. Because mm-hmm. granny gonna granny gonna set them roots, you know. And I even told my kids, I said, the season that we're in, you know, I gotta go and take care of and prepare some things for us to come. That's and right. Said, but what y'all need right now, because mommy has coddled y'all because after the divorce, like discipline kind of, you know, through the divorce, discipline went out the window. So I was really gentle to my kids. I started gentle parenting and they kind of got out of order. And I told them, like, that's okay, because I'm trying to tell y'all, like, my mama raised me. And when I step out and leave, go to work. And y'all do the stuff that y'all doing now with her? Oh, sis, bruh, her's going to break you off a new one. And she does, yeah. and I say, don't call me. Don't call me telling me nothing that your greed don't did. Because whatever she did, you needed it. In real life, you needed it. And mm-hmm. we have to understand that if our parents raise us, then we are alive and we're successful. And not man successful. We got to understand that man's success and God's success are two totally different things. That's right. If, if, if you are a true woman of God and you walking in your worth and you walking in with your God, like it don't matter how much money in your bank account, how much money in your pocket, God got you. If you got faith and you believe it and you living for Christ, your mama did a, like a hell of a good job in real life. And don't discount and say, my mama just did bare minimum. No, your mama mm-hmm. did what she needed to do because that's all she had to do. Like in the state of Texas, like I'm talking as a parent who took class. The state of Texas tell you what the minimum standards are for a kid. And I'm telling you that if you're still alive today, your mother is the most amazing woman you know. And you should That's give right. her a call today and just tell her mama, I thank you. Because your mama did some stuff that she didn't have to do in order for you to still survive. My mom did a lot of stuff. She shared a lot of stuff she didn't share. You know what I mean? But me going into that situation myself, I'm getting a glimpse because my mom is still shielding me. I still don't get the full throttle of what my mama had to experience. And my mama tell you, I keep, the, you know, even when I was married, she'd say, man, I keep my grandkids because I give you a break because nobody ever gave right. you a break. That's you right. know what I mean? And yeah. people got to, re- you know, you got to represent for your mom because if you got a mama who is just even alive and breathing, you thank her if you still breathing. If you're not That's in right. a grave, you're not in a jailhouse, if you're not crazy, you thank God for your mama because your mama is the, your mama is the realest player that you're going to ever have on your team. And mm-hmm. that's realest conversation I could have with anybody because I literally like got through my divorce because of my mom. My mom held my hand and she literally took me to the office <laughs> to go fight for my baby back and they said do you want a divorce? And I said yeah. And my mom was like yeah we want a divorce. Like yeah man, we want all of this you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she yeah. carried me through the way and, and to end 2022 to tell my mom like mom I thank you like I'm strong enough now. Because when I was weak, my mama was strong. Was she really strong? Probably not. My mama probably went home and cried just like I did. But she never let me see it. And we discount and we beat our moms down so much. And we don't know until I, until we sit in where our mama have said. That's right. You know That's what I'm right. saying? Of, of, of how much our mama, like when you say that love goes deeper, a mother's love, bro, that's deep, deep, deep. Like you can't even, you can define a mother's love in the language of the words that whips they have created. Mm. It's not fathom how much a mother can love you because my mom loves me more than I love myself in real yeah. life. You know? yeah. I mean, she 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 represents like a different type of love. Like, you know, and if you got a mama, like when people say things about their mom, I'm like, I pray that God gives you enough time, your mom enough time so you can really meet that woman. 
because you don't know her story. You know what I mean? You don't know why your mom is the way that she is. Like, I know why my mama snap. I know why she go off sometimes. You know what I'm saying? But at yeah. the same time, like, I don't know all her story. But for my mom to wake up and to smile every day, sis put on her lipstick, she put her earrings on, she blinging, you know what I mean? And my mom could have, like, my divorce, like, literally, I've never seen my mom age. My mom has always looked like she was 29 and fine. That's her nickname, 29 and fine. I saw my mom age, and I saw I did that. And I can remember calling my mom being so frustrated in my divorce that I began to take my anger out on her. And I could hear that whimper in my mom's voice. And I said, man, you hurt your mom. And I cried because to hurt your mom, that's that's like the ultimate no-no. That's like, like that's, that, that hurts, you know? And I tell my kids, like, don't hurt your mama no matter what. Not because I'm your mama, but because that's your number one rider. Whether she want to show up or not, She's going to be there and with bells on. You know, mm. my mom, like, somebody threatened to put a bullet in my head just in November, I think it was. It was like October, November. You know, I had a prophet tell me, you need protection. I literally leave from talking to this prophet, and I go to Walmart. It just so happened to pig at Walmart, too. I didn't even know it. And this man pull up on me, and he threatened to put a bullet in my head. My mama don't care. Like, this man don't know. Like, I'm going off. He mentioned a gun, so I backed up. Next thing I know, her come. Mother dear, you know what I mean? Queen mother gets out that car and she tell Walmart, y'all need to call the police. <laughs> and I'm looking like, y'all probably better call the police because what she's saying is she finna shut Walmart down and she told him, I'm finna shut the whole establishment down. And you know what I mean? Because that's how big a mother's love is. Like this man yeah. talking about shooting her daughter. My mama like, I don't care what kind of gun he got. I'm mm. finna run up on him because sir, you're not finna talk to my daughter like that. Yeah. My mother would, would, would literally die for me. My mother would, would take care of my kids for me. And so even with that storm, I was so nervous. My mom telling me, man, push come and shove. I mean, the hotel is filling up. Me and the kids, we'll just sleep in the car. I'm like, what in the... And something said, man, your mama got you to where you at, right? Your She's mama a survivor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, if your mama made it 62 years, she know more than you. Mm -hmm. And if you said you trust your mama with your kids, you can't question your mama with your kids. So That's I didn't right. call her to question none of her decisions because I didn't want to make her feel any type of way because I said I trust her. And if yeah. you trust somebody, you can't question that person. And if it's your mama and your mama took care of you, you got to know she's going to take care of her grandbabies. That's right. I think y'all love y'all grandbabies. We do better with them grandbabies than we do with our kids. <laughs> that <part. laughs> But yeah. Yeah. Excellent, no. excellent. You know, that that kind of reminds me uh, leading up to our mother-daughter tea. That's the stuff we're going to be talking about because I think there needs to be some mending uh, of the hearts uh, because some of the things that you're saying in here, uh, there are some uh, ladies that are experiencing those things uh, with their mothers and just not understanding how love, how deep love goes. Let me tell you something. Love goes deeper than the heart can imagine even when a mother puts a child up for adoption. True story. True story. Love runs very deep because if that mom knows that she cannot take care of that child, that's a mother's instinct, you know, that you want that child to be safe. You want that child to be well, though the child may not understand it, you know, down the line or whatever, you know, but I think it's a very uh, 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 selfless act uh, to do that and to literally, you just don't know that child, 37 years old, that mother still cries herself to sleep at night because she had to make a decision like, y'all, we got some conversation. We're going to talk about it at the mother-daughter yeah. team. And I can't yeah. wait uh, for you guys to jump in. But uh, Nan, thank you so much, uh, you know, for your transparency. And I love uh, you know, what God is doing uh, with you and your mom and the grandbabies and all of that. I just say, relax and enjoy the ride. You know, God is going to, he's going to put the pieces together and he's going to bring understanding. And oh my God, it's so much because I know what God uh, did with me and my daughter. Now I have girls, I mean, boys, and I'll go to hell and back with them boys too. Uh, I'll never forget. And we're going to bring Miss Peggy on. I'll never forget uh, before we left Tyler. Uh, I mean, I mean, not Tyler, Dallas, literally two weeks before I got, no, I had already made it back home and I'm at the job. I've transferred to a job in Tyler and I get a phone call to say, 
uh, that my son, my baby son has a child on the way. On my job, mm -hmm. they found me. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm having this conversation and I'm thinking nobody gets left behind. So I go and um, I make an appointment to meet with the mom, you know, talk to her. We had lived in the same apartment complex. And so I'm not saying that it couldn't be. And um, and y'all, I did everything I could. I uh, I didn't even know for sure if this was my son's child or not. Uh, I took her shopping. I made sure she had the things that she needed for the baby because we're in Tyler now, you know, whatever you need. Uh, Devonte, we were there when Devonte was born. Uh, so when we get to the hospital, um, no, I think I was still working there. I was still at UT Southwestern in Dallas. And uh, we get to the hospital. She's at Parkland, which the hospitals are next to each other. And we go over to the hospital. Now, mind you, we, we have no reference of violence, me and my children. We don't have any reference of that. Uh, the grandfather comes to the hotel and um, he tries to make a threat toward my son. And uh, though at that, that particular time, um, he, he couldn't get to my son if he wanted to, but uh, it was a warrior that rose up in me. And I told this grown man who had literally jumped on the, the, the wife's new husband in the parking lot, I don't take lightly to threats. Yeah. And I meant what I said. You do not put a threat against my child, not a child I brought to this earth. You don't put a threat toward my child. And I think that man had bullied his family so much. He wasn't used to people standing up to him or whatever. And I told him, I said, don't you forget what I said. Don't you ever make no threat toward my child in any kind of way. I still, still to this day, Devonte is 21 years old. And, um, and then turned out the young boy was not even my son's uh, child after all that time. We still mm. love Devontae. He had nothing to do with that. But it was just the idea. Families do that kind of stuff. And you think that a mother or a parent is not going to stand up to you? No, we don't take lightly to that. And uh, I'm, not to, I'm not the one to be bullied with people. Because the very moment you let people think that you're scared of them, mm. they will start doing crazy stuff. So I think that God has probably given us a, a mantle um, you know, of, of a tough exterior uh, to where people just don't mess with us, you know, because we really don't know what we would do because love runs deeper than the heart can imagine. Amen. We got a story behind that phrase that I don't know why God gave me that, but we're going to have a story behind that. So Miss Nancy, thank you so much. We appreciate you um, continually praying for you that God will ease your heart while the children and mom are navigating through this tough season of winter you know, and just knowing this too shall pass. It will and pass. It will be over next week. You know, it's Texas. It'll be over. Hey, man, yeah, it'll, <laughs> it'll change right now if if it wanted to. So thank you so much, Miss Nan. Uh, Mrs. Peggy, look like Miss Peggy is boxed out in the car this morning. I don't, do you have electricity today, uh, Peggy? No. <laughs> no, no electricity. No, no electricity. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Well, I, I figured Nan had done enough. So, I, you know, I, everything just started going across my head and I was like, wow, nothing else needs to be said. But um, I come to you all this morning. I, I think about a lot of things, but um, I, had two, I had two daughters. They're like almost seven years apart. They both are different. They're very different. But I'm still that one mom. So I wanted to tell you all a little story about the friends that they can come across and the jobs that they can come across. When you're looking at <clears throat> jobs and career, they're totally two different things. And I'm just like a mother hen. I watch everything my kids do, at least I try to. As they were coming up, I made sure I listened and understood where they wanted to go. And the things that I thought that they shouldn't go, I'm the parent that always, I would take the stern wheel. Uh, my oldest daughter, she, um, I think she was about 14, 13, 14. We were sitting on the porch one day and two of our friends drove up in a little red car. 
And uh, they wanted her to go too, you know, somewhere with them. And she said, no, I, I can't go. And they turned around and they told her, uh, you grown. Your mother can't tell oh. you what to do. Oh. So I said, really? I said, I tell you what, those are not your friends anymore, okay? So she lost those friends. So uh, as life moved on, she got old enough to go to school, you know, to go to, well, like high school. She went to high school with these same girls, and um, which was fine, because I, I still love the girls to this day. But they couldn't be the friend that I needed her to have uh, for um, her future life. So I told her, I said, you know what? I'm your friend. Where do you want to go? If you want to go to the movie, we go into the movies. Wherever you want to go, I'm going with you. So I became my oldest daughter friend because I wouldn't allow her to go with the friends that she chose because what those girls was doing, I didn't play it on her doing it because personally I recognized I was a single parent and I didn't want to be a single parent a single, and a single grandmother. And, and you know, I didn't want to do a whole lot of things that a lot of people are doing nowadays. Like I didn't want to be a grandmother at uh, 30 something, 40 something, you know, like that. I didn't because I hadn't really fulfilled my life. When you're a single parent, you want, you want, you want a life after your children. You don't want a life, uh, you, you, you don't want to ever go into that stage. I did, and I didn't want to go into that stage of being a, oh, I just raised my kids. Oh my God, now I got to raise these grandkids. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to raise my kids, uh, have a life, and then, if my kids haven't had kids by then, ask them to have grandkids. That's what I did. When I got ready for my kids, uh, for grandkids, I told them, look, I'm getting older now. I don't want to be on a stick. I want to be able to help and enjoy my grandkids. So that's what my kids did. But when my oldest daughter, as she grew up and started growing through life, I mean, she uh, she, she graduated from high school. And, and, you know, I told her, I said, look, you, you know, it was an automatic thing in, in this house to like, you know, you got to go to college. So they automatically knew they had to go to college. Your children never get too old. At 18, 19 years old, these kids are still kids because they don't have any experience. So you can't just put them out the gate like that. They're not prepared. It's something about God. He'll let you know when your kids are fulfilled. So what I did with my oldest, I actually went into the classroom at Texas College. She was having problems in math. She had a she had a, she had an instructor there that had a problem with her. So if you got a problem with her, you got a problem with me too. I want to see what the problem is. So what I do, I go to school at Texas College with my daughter. So uh, as I sat there in class, I monitored the instructor, and uh, and you know the next semester, uh, probably before that semester was over, she was gone. But the but the moral of that story is that you actually watch your kids, make sure that they go through a life that's a little bit better than yours. My kids had little part-time jobs. And, and my old my baby girl, she got big enough. Nan got big enough to where she could work. Actually, with her first job, I hired her. She's 15 years old. We changed her address. We changed her, we changed her uh, age to 16 versus 15. So she ended up having to work too. But my thing is, when kids go out on jobs, you need to listen to what, their supervisors are saying to them as black women and men, because what they will do, they'll knock their self-esteem down. You can't sit there and let your children be on a job because you think you need $3. If you need $3, what I did when I needed extra money, I said, oh, I work on weekends. I mean, if I'm dating, dating don't, didn't give me money, it may give you some, but it didn't give me some. So I, I just got me two jobs. So I just start working on uh, weekends. I worked through the week, worked on weekends, went through school, everything that I needed to do to, you know, to provide for my children and be support, you know, have the, have the financial support without looking at some, some man, I would just work about it, you know, so my kids could be able to have it. But when you have children that's out there working and they come home and tell you uh, the supervisor said certain things to them, you don't let. No, regardless whether they're black, white, pink, or purple, you don't let their supervisor uh, have the front, you know, the front, the front forefront to say things to your children that they shouldn't say. 
So what I did as a mother, I fired my kids on these jobs. I would call these jobs and say, hey, uh, Nan won't be working for you today. I just fired her. Uh, Sheena won't be working for you today. I just fired her. You can't talk to my kids any kind of way. So I, I've always taught my kids that they weren't junk. That they, are, they're always, they always knew that they were somebody. Because God didn't make no junk. So my two kids knew that. So I focused on my girls the whole term they was coming through. And what I said, I said, you know what? You make sure that they didn't do everything that you did. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I did enroll in college and was going to college until I got married. And I thought you're supposed to quit, you know, and do whatever the husband say do. So, you know, that's what I did. I quit college, had, a, had, had, you know, had another kid. I had already had the first kid. So I turned out had another kid. So, you know, and, and, and that, was, that was okay. It worked out because what I did, I sat at home and I figured it out. I said, you know what, I, I have two kids. This is not the right type of husband I need. So I divorced that boy on purpose because he was a kid I was grown, okay? So you have to know who you are. And when you when you marrying these folks because of love, you know, whether you're a man or a woman, you don't really know them. You're just looking at the high that you're in love and he's cute, he's tall. And you think you're cute too. So you think you're a good couple, okay? And that's all you're going by. You're not, and then you're looking at money where well, you know money gonna pay all the bills. So that's cool to the, all the money. But still, you know what? You can have all the money, the tallest husband. You can have the perfect body. You can just think that you just all of that and still won't be happy. So I knew I wasn't fulfilled. I found out, I guess, within that eight years that I knew that I wasn't fulfilling my goals in life. And I couldn't do them there with him. And my kids, I couldn't, I couldn't express them. I want to so I divorced on purpose so that I could become who I am today. And, you know, without no anger, no, no mess and drama and things of that nature, because I don't believe in that. But what I did, I put the man aside and I put my kids on my forefront. And when you put your kids on your forefront and you take care of those kids and make sure everything is running like it should run with your children. Like I made sure that my kids enrolled in college. I made sure every semester that I was there making sure I even enrolled in the school, going to school with them, with the oldest one I know. And, you know, I made sure that my kids was going through college. I was making sure that my kids would get a degree. I made sure that if they wanted to become a queen uh, at the school, they could. I made sure they had the HBCU experience. My baby was a queen every year. She was some queen every year. My oldest, she was the queen, I think, twice. But whatever their hearts desired, I made sure I just pushed those kids through. And what I wanted out of those girls, I said, you know what? I want to make sure that they would graduate and get a get a career job, making funding. You're making sure their funding was like as much money as I was making, or they could make more. As long as I didn't have to pay rent, wherever they think, thought they was going, and pay a car note and insurance and all this stuff that, you know, moms and dads have to pay to this day just to keep kids out of your house. I was gonna do that, they can stay at home. I mean, the house is still the same house. They still got the same bedroom, stay at home. I'm not paying no house note for you. I'm not paying no car notes for you. I'm not doing none of this stuff. Stay at home, get yourself together, make enough money so when you get out there, you can do that. So that's what I did. I put my kids, uh, you know, my baby wanted to leave Soon as she walked across the stage, she brought me her uh, degree and she says, mom, can I move? Because she had, she was already teaching at 19. She had saved every dime. She had given it to her oldest sister. And she was like, mom, can I move? I said, no, you can't move yet. She says, what's next? I said, well, you need a teacher certification. So I know that'll lock you in on the job. So you won't have to come back to this house. You know, you, something has to be really serious for you to come through this house again. So my kids are always welcome home, but that, you know, they know that they have a career and they knew that if they came home, they were just gonna come home temporarily to get themselves together. I mean, they don't wanna stay home. You know, the way I raised them, they don't really wanna stay home. They, want, they don't mind coming home because they're welcome home, but they wanna pass through. And that's the kind of kids that you want. You wanna nurture them so going through their little lives that they don't know anything about so that when you see that those kids have developed enough skills to make money, to pay for themselves, then you can allow them to go out there. 
you can allow them to go out there. My baby wanted to move. You know, she just, she was three years old. She was already just, she was like, she was just like Addie. She was just already ready for the world. So I said, you know what? Once she get a certification, I'm gonna, she went, she finally got it. And when she got it, I said, that you can move out of my house if that's what you want. She wanted to go to town, I guess, and move closer to the hamburger. So I let her go out there and she got out there and got her an apartment and, and you know, she got married and, you know, she just moved really too quickly for me. But sometimes you have to sit back and let your children taste a little of, the, little of the world that you was trying to tell them about, but they didn't hear you. So I let her go on. My oldest kid was still home. She, I said, y'all can stay at this house till y'all get y'all PhD. Well, I didn't really mean the PhD because my oldest girl, she was really working on her PhD, 28 years old. She had already earned her master's and she was working on a PhD. So I had already bought them a house right here in the neighborhood where I live. So I actually dressed the house, cut the utilities on, and put my oldest out in a positive way. I said, you 28 years old now, you ought to be able to live over there across the street by yourself and sleep in the house by yourself, you and your dog, get your dog. So she she moved on. But what, what happened was she 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 got a job. She was very successful and you know she was making money. But the, you know, you have to stick with your children. You gotta stick with them. And my husband, I got one of the most. He the biggest man I, I can say in the whole wide world. He ain't the only man I ever dated, but he's the biggest man that I, ever, that I ever dated, that I ever married, because he has the most Christian understanding ever. You know, I, could tell, I can tell him things about what we need to do, and he'll sit right there with me accordingly, and we'll talk about these things, and we make it happen. So when my kids go through things, you know, we, 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 we help pick those girls up, and we push them right on through. You can't leave them out there. I'm gonna tell you why you don't. It's a it's a reason why I stick by my children because there's nobody else out there gonna treat them like you. That's everybody know that. But you really have to look at your own life. You really have to look at where you come from. You really have to look at where you've been and have you done and what did you do. You really have to, you know, you're a Christian. But what did you do before you became a Christian? What did you do coming up to here? I mean, if my kids drink a bottle of wine, fine. I drank two bottles of wine. If my kids went to the club last night, fine. I went to the club Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday evening too. You see? So you have to look at where you've gone. Did I go to church coming up? My mother, until she died, was still making us go to church and sing in the choir. Yeah, you learn those Christian values, but you still have to be real with your life. You have to see that you Look at what you did. Don't beat on your daughter. Look at what you did. Don't beat on your son. I raised my brother's four sons. I understood them. I wrote, you know, I raised my kids, but each time a kid that I have touched or my girls, when things go on in their life, I look at my life. And when you look at your life, then you you relax. You're really relaxed. Because what they're doing is very light compared to what you've done. So you can't you can't sit there and and look like you you, you know you had straight arrow because you wasn't because God didn't make us perfect like that. You know, he just don't do that. So just you know when you're raising these kids, just because they're like my baby, she's 37. I know she's 37. My oldest I forgot how old she is. She's about maybe 42, 43 or something like that. But I still she's in Alabama but I still watch her. I talk to her every day. But when my kids, both of them have gone through things with their children. And, you know, I'm there. If I'm at work, I've never had a job my kids or grandkids come, come, come through. You have to know who you are and know your place in your personal life with these jobs before you try to get these jobs. So that's why, you know, I watch where I've always worked. I mean, even when I was at Whataburger, my kids could come to Whataburger, wherever, I, wherever I've gone, my kids could always be there. I mean, every professional job I've had, if I'm on a plane and my kid's on a plane, because when you think they're grown and they're teenagers, that's the time you really need to be watching your children. You need to be watching them. When they're 11 or 12 years old, getting big enough to write with a pencil, that's when you need to be teaching them how to write. You know, back in the day, we had a checkbook. I think y'all use debit cards now like I do. But my baby, my oldest was the driver, because you know you had to drive around and pay your light bill, water bill, gas bill. My oldest was the driver. My baby was the one that wrote the checks. I would give them my checks, my Whataburger check, my Long John Silver check, any check, wherever I worked at. My kids took those checks, knew how to go to the bank, 
knew how to cash them. If you teach your kids what you have, they won't be running around here begging and thinking you wasn't giving them nothing. If you teach your kids the value of, give them the light bill, water bill, gas bill, not for them to pay, but show them before they get old enough to pay it. Show them the light bill, water bill, gas bill. You know, my kids are grown now. My kids don't come to me and say, I need this or give me this. They don't look for me to give, you know, financial stability to the children. But if you teach them young, when they get big, bigger, they won't look at you like she didn't give me anything or she didn't do this. My kids had everything. They had all of their needs and most of their wants. And I feel like I'm, I'm really comfortable with saying that they had a great childhood life. I gave my kids a lot. I had a lot coming up, but I went through a lot more than they went through. I kept, I stayed stable. The house where I live right now, I think my baby was like six or seven when I moved here and, and we still here. They still have bedrooms here. They can always come home here. You know, this is where we live. So, you, you know, you have to make sure that your children are okay. Once your children get okay, let me tell you the greatest part of when your children get educated or on the, on the greatest job and, and doing well and, and you know, God allows you uh, to have your other half, your greatest other half. God allows you then. After you fulfilled your children, God allows you then. You can't have a man, a woman in your life yakking with your kids, telling you when they're 13, they grown, telling you when they, uh, it didn't take but one man to tell me my kids was grown at 13. That was the end of that. You know, so you can't, you know, your children not grow you, they taller, they bigger. And if you date in the, you know, you date, they tell you your kids to, you, you know, your kids wrong, we can do this. We, no, we can't. If you want to, your kids, you got to protect your kids, yourself, you and God. And you have to take your kids through. Are they going to be perfect? No. Are you going to fight them? Yes. Even when you don't want to, even when you're tired. I know I gave, I, you know, in my head, I gave up. I wanted to give up, but I kept pushing through. My baby girl, I was at Texas College working. When she was a freshman, I tried to knock her out and kill her right there in my office. And you know, people were like, well, you're gonna lose your job. I said, fine, I ain't gonna lose my daughter. I'm not gonna lose my baby. You can lose a job, you can get another job. But your children, if you don't work with your kids while they coming up, because they don't know, they just think they know. And you have to be the one that walk through your children, walk through them, let them know you'll knock them out. So they can move on. If you want your children to be successful, you're going to have to work. You're going to have to stay there and stay steady with your children. Because if you don't, they're going to fall by the wayside. And you know what that's going to do? That's going to bring them back to your house where you and your husband is. And their children. Sometimes and their husband. So if you do the right thing by your children, if you're a single parent, if you do the right thing, God would, al would allow you to re relax. How do I know that? Because I live that life. My grandkids, all four of them, I mean, I don't get to see the baby until I go over there. When I go over there, I stay. I don't care when I come back. I just, I just stayed there a month. I just got back. I've been back two weeks. But I make sure I give my grandkids a whole lot of time. My mother was, had 12 children. My mother that raised me, she had two children. But she was like me. She taught school. She worked a lot. And I spent a lot of time with her. I spent a lot of time with both of my moms. I had the greatest moms. I say that all the time because I can look at, I can look at both of them within me. And, and, and I'm glad because it's nothing but you, a power crunch for me. So I, I know what it's like to like work out there like at Waterbury, because I use that for an example. And I know what it's like out there being in a career job. I know what it's like having, you know, a decent, I know what, it ha what it's like to have a decent life for your children. But I can guarantee you, if you take care of your children, if your children know that you are there, like my baby, yeah, she my 50 state kid, but she been that way ever since she was born. So you know your children, but you got to love your kids no matter what. You got to walk in. You can't put nothing else out there other than God. God is the only one that you could put out there that could, could sustain to where you know for a fact that you are able to do for your children like you should properly. You got to be straight with your children in order to develop great children and what it does again like i say it leaves you with a relaxing life i'm i'm here you know I, I find things to do to keep myself busy but do i want to go back out there in the field 
I don't think so. It'll take God and Jesus and the Lord to put me back out there because the greatest thing I'm doing now, I actually get to not do it. Nan is in transition, but I'm not doing what I'm doing because of Nan so much as Nan. I'm doing it because it's a joy for me. It's a joy for me to just enjoy my grandkids. I want to be able to do things that I really want to do. So that's a better thing for me. You know, I know she needs to be in transition. I know she's young. And parents are going to have to understand when kids are going through, remember when you was 30 something? Remember when you was 20 something? See, life really don't get flat. It goes up and it goes down. It goes up and it goes down. And when you get in them little 40s, like my, my oldest baby, she's in those 40s. And guess what, y'all? Her life is like, going so smooth now. See, at times, you got to know who you are and where you've been and admit you've been there too. Admit you've been there. And once you see that you've done that, you won't be so hard on your children. You'll do what it takes. So my oldest kid, I have stuck beside her. If she needed me, I was always there. Before I, I lived in Alabama. When I left Alabama, she was driving a Mercedes. But to me, it, it, was, a raggedy, it was a raggedy car to me. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and put her in a new car. So I went ahead and bought her a new car and I come back to Texas, to Texas college. I made sure my baby could come home. I opened up a bank account up there like she have so I can be able to transfer money if I needed to. So you make sure that you protect your children, you know, and most of it, not, it hadn't been about money with my kids. Just being there for your children works, y'all. Being there for your kids. Your kids know that you're there. And that's what I've done with my children. So I hope I've reached out to try to show you some points on how great it, it will be when you take care of your children. Because right now I'm free. My husband, when I decided to say, well, well, I'm not going back to Texas college. And he said, okay, honey, that's all he said. He come out of Afghanistan. He didn't go back. He's getting ready now on the 20th, 20th of next month. He'll he have to, you know, go back to Kuwait, but he's been off these three years with me. I guess he see I'm just fine. So he's going back out there. I'm not, I'm gonna look at my grandkids so I can half kill them and teach them something. You know, you got to give your kids the wisdom that you've had. Give them some things that you've learned. And I'm glad my children allows me to uh, try to knock their kids out like they need, you know, and give them love and flourish them with all the nurture. And so it's a joy to wake up and know that I can hug my grandkids every day. If they're not here, I can still talk to them. I talk to my baby, uh, my youngest grandson. I talk to him every morning on the way to school. And when he get out of school, I call my daughter and say, are you at the bus, you know, at the, you know are you in line uh, waiting, on, waiting on grandbaby so you can pick him up? I'm still running my kids, kind of, sort of. It makes me feel good, but they allows me to do that. But that's, uh, that, that, that is what ha have been on my mind. Each week, something come to me and say, you know, tell them this experience so that they can see that even though they're giving their last dime. I mean, I have let out a lot of money with my kids, but you know what? Money can't buy your children. Take care of your children. Take care of your children. Let them know you love them. You, you know, my kids are leaving and I'm so happy. I gave them my blessing, my grace, and my mercy. I give them all of this so they can continue to be blessed. They, all they need to do is find them a church home and continue to serve the Lord. And you know, that's all. And as a mom, you just continue to pray. And you, you know, God give them to you, but you have, to give, you have to give them back. You have to give them their wings and you have to know from your heart that your children are ready. I know that my baby is ready. She's prepared. I knew when my oldest one was ready. I think me and my baby both knew. We were so excited that she, she, she got to live away from home and, and grow up because she is the baby. The oldest kid is the baby. I mean, now she's a, she's a, she's grown now. She acts like a grown lady now. So I'm proud of that. So that's, you know, that's what I bring to you guys today. And I hope I said something to help you guys, you know, as you live on with your children and, you know, when it comes down to your mother, I'm the mother that'll tell you, I'm going to tell you now, whether you want to hear it or not, because if I die in a few minutes, you already got it. You know, you don't want to hear it, but you're going to hear it because I don't want anybody else telling you something that I could have already told you. So if my kids do something that's different, they pick it up up the street. Because I promise you, I, I tried to raise my kids the better way. My kids could walk around in their panties and bras in the house all their lives. They didn't never have to worry about a man walking through the house. 
or thinking he can live at the house. The kid, this same house, these kids ain't never had to worry about none of that type of stuff because I made sure my baby was graduated <laughs> with a job where she could make money and all of that stuff. I had a clean house and then I remarried. And I, and I have a great life, you know, but you got to do it. You got to do it sometime because I could have been married. Beautiful guys. I, I've been attracted to a lot of guys. They've been attracted to me. But I had my kids on the line, y'all. When your kids are on the line, take care of your kids first. God will give you a good man if that's what you want. He'll give you a good woman if that's what you want. But you want more than good, trust me. You want more than just good. That's not good enough. If he don't have any talent, any, any type of standard about himself, you better run, even if you don't have the shoes on. People used to say, put your tennis shoes on. You better run. Just run. If he don't have... He does not have any type of Christianity like yours. You better move forward because you know, if you already know God come first and you already know God have taken care of you before you met him, you better make sure he know the Lord and understand who you are. So that's about all I got to say. I think I'm preaching too much today. <laughs> you do, you're doing you. an excellent Thank job. I love all of you and I enjoy this. I'm out here in this car. Hey, yeah, I, I told Peggy yesterday, I said, now that's dedication. <laughs> that's something that's something I would do <laughs> once I once I have given my commitment to something. And uh, but we do understand, Peggy, if you couldn't have shown up, but I think that uh we show up because it feeds us too at the same time, you know, to be able to give back to others. So I appreciate all the words and uh, you have made my heart feel so well because I'm that I don't I don't I don't do everything like Peggy does, but we do things in the same vein. I think it's the same heartbeat uh, that we do it from. Uh, love runs deeper than the heart can imagine, you know. And you just never know what the children are going to need or you know anything like that. And I I can say. I'm thankful. I don't know when the day happened, but I don't have to do as much as I used to. You know, I was, I was what they call 10 toes in before everything those kids needed. I think my, uh, I took the children one by one, you know, no matter where they, where they were, I still do that now. I work with them one by one, but Jessica, uh, being the last one, um, I made sure Jessica was good. Um, I, I can, I can attest to that story of those cars, uh, buying the cars. If I saw them in some raggedy, uh, we were in Dallas and Jordan was just was driving this old, oh my God, that truck smoked all the time. And I'm like, yes, that's not good for you and your daughter to be stranded on the side of the road. And all, all it took was her getting stranded one time. That was the end of that. That's a wrap. We're not doing that anymore. And then plus, we don't mess around with broke stuff anyway. Broke people, broke money, you know, anything. We don't broke, get rid of that broke stuff, you know, so that you can tell your mind that you deserve better than that. So, yeah, what, one of the things I wanted to add on, what I, I, let me tell you something else I did because of going through life, like I said, I, you know, it'll take a lifetime to really just talk about me and what went on in my life. But, you know, I've always, before I went, before I started working at Texas College, I've always owned four or five cars. And it was a reason for that. I have never told people that, but I have always kept calls with full coverage insurance because you don't know where your Hey Amen. Y'all, Peggy's, Peggy's had to drop off this morning. Um, yeah. Yeah. And she, was, I, and she I, was on fire. <laughs> she yeah, was on too much fire. And I, and I know a lot of the people in East Texas that the internet is messing up. But let me tell you, I thank y'all so much for being online with us this morning and, you know, pushing through, you know, because these stories, um, it, it's, it's the, uh, that's why I call them mommy, uh, mommy daughter moments. Uh, they are things that help you to relax in life, you know, because that may have been something that you woke up this morning with, with a concern, you know, about you and your daughters and, you know, whether you guys are, you know, getting along well with each other. Um, you know, these these uh, ladies are coming in just so we can, you know, maybe what do you say, add to your faith, whatever this other thing is, whether it be virtue, whether it be knowledge, whether it be brotherly love and kindness. Uh, you know, you just never know. Uh, now, um, uh, ladies, the way one person raises their child, it does not have to be the thing that you do. Uh, we're just talking to you about the love factors. That's all the things that we, you know, 
we go through to do. And there's always a why behind, you know, what we do. And I think that's what Miss Peggy is letting us know. She's got a why behind uh, the things that she does. And, uh, and I'm quite sure the girls have definitely appreciated. Uh, before Miss Peggy gets a chance to come back on, if she does, even if she doesn't get a chance to come back on, I want to stop for a moment to see if anybody has any comments before we dismiss on this morning. Uh, you know, maybe some tips of something that you too have done and you have found those things to be very beneficial in your walk in life. Anybody this morning? And thank y'all for hanging in there. Good morning, Ms. Kathy. Good morning, Ms. Kathy. Um, I, I know it's, some, it's, it's a takeaway for me, what she just said about when you know that the Lord has uh, gotten you to a place in your heart that he's going to take care of your children, you know, the rest of the way. You know, you've taken them as far as you can take them. And then, you know, you always give them back to the Lord, but they're still under your care. Like when she was talking about uh, doing things for them and, you know, helping them out as far as, you know, they might can do it for themselves, but you go ahead and get it done and then walk them the rest of the way. So that's where I am right now. And I, I've talked to you about that, Miss Marilyn, with my yeah. daughter and my granddaughters. You know, I want to know. That when that day is come, that I have peace in my heart, that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. And to hear Miss Peggy say that, to know that that time will come in my life, that I'll have that peace to That's where, right. like she said, you know, and they're going to do what they want to do because like Nancy said, they have their own minds. They got their own brains. They're going to do what they want to do. But as a parent, just like she said, she go hard for hers. I go hard for mine too. And not just in doing things. The harder I go is, in prayer because yeah. I know if I cover them in prayer then God has it the rest of the way but I want to feel that peace in my heart to know that it's going to get done That's you know right. you can talk to you blue in the face but you know just like Moses didn't see the promised land but he also had to trust God to know that the people he led to the Red Sea they were going to cross it not with, with Moses' oh. help but with God's help you know, he took them as far as he could take them. But God is the one that parted the sea. So I got to know that God is going to do the rest. If I get her to where God wants me to get her to, if I release her into his hands, then he's got the rest of the way. He's got the rest of the way. And I, I appreciate Miss Peggy for saying that, you know, and we kind of talked on Saturday and she gave me some more, um, you know, just some tips and stuff of what to do, you know. And I know y'all have, you know, heard me talk about my daughter and my granddaughter and stuff, but that's my heart. My heart. That is truly my heart. So I just wanted to say that this morning. And thank you, Miss Peggy and Miss Nancy, for your uh, transparency this morning. Thank both of you this morning. Thank you for letting okay. me share. Okay, I just, I just want to, I just want to let you all know, your children like. You never know what might happen. And like, like I said, you don't know what, you know where you've been, but you don't know where you're going. And like where I live used to be a long way from home. You know, when I say home from my family and even if they are my family or friends, people just don't want to put up with you. They're not going to come get you, take you to work. They're not going to take you to uh -huh. class. They're not going to take you to the grocery store. They don't care anything about that. What they will do is sit around and talk about what you don't have. So if you prepare yourself, I don't, I wouldn't say go out and buy you some brand new cars, get you some decent cars. I call them motor transmission cars that cranks up so that you'll be able to help, to help yourself. Cause at one time my kids wasn't old enough to drive. My kids actually started driving at 11 and 12 years old, honestly driving at 11 and 12 years old, because being a single parent, you really need help. And when they got ready to go to driving school, they took themselves to driving school. They went over there and parked the car and went on in class. And that's how they got their license. So you have to, you have to do whatever it takes. And then versus me letting other folks keep my kids, I kept my kids at home, taught them to shut the doors, lock the doors, don't answer the door for anybody. And you know, you have to do things with God. That's you right. can't do things with folk. Your own folks will turn you in, CPS. <laughs> ain't nobody ever called them on me because I ain't never told nobody my business. <laughs> you see, you have to learn how it's called shut up. I heard last week it said hush. Learn how to be quiet. 
just be quiet. When, it, when it's you and your children, my children, we call each other the three mustard tears because we have actually stuck together. And those cars I keep because just like right now, you know, my, ba my baby have to have a car now. My oldest daughter used to have to have a car or if she need one now. I want my kids, to, my husband, if because he, he don't know how to take care of his car, if he needed a car. You know, you got to keep your life, keep going. You can't just stop, oh, my car is on flat. Learn how to fix a flat. Learn how to boost your car. It's a whole lot of things I taught my kids because you can always still be a lady. I think I'm one of the greatest classes ladies ever. But when it comes down to doing things like working on a car, I try. If I can fix it, I fix it. That's right. If I can mow my yard, I mow my yard. Learn how to do things instead of blaming it. You know, you don't wait on somebody or wait on your man or wait on your spouse to do a lot of things. Do it yourself if you know how to do it. And if mm -hmm. he's not doing enough around there, uh, hey, you live my life. Just live it, live it, live it with you and your children. And that way you won't have to worry about things of that nature. But a lot of things that goes on in my life, I do it, you know, it, it do it in a, in a in a peaceful way where my kids can be, my husband can be, everybody can be at peace because I got to still live my life. I can't stop and take you to work because you ain't got no car. You know, I can't stop and do this because you ain't, you don't have this. So I try to provide that. So if, if your children know that they got that connection with you, with whatever you have, share it with your children because when you die you're going to leave it all to them anyway so go ahead and take care of them don't wait till you uh, uh die to just leave them something go ahead and try to let them live within That's your right. means right now teach them how to eat a hundred dollar meal put them on an airplane and let them fly give them things that you know a man will give them but you done already give them so they know how to act mm -hmm. they used to money they used to cars they used to airplanes you know, let your children get used to things. Don't let your kids just go out there just naked and don't know nothing because that's where they get caught. That's right. So if you teach your children and don't let them depend on the man to pay all the bills. My husband can pay all these bills, but guess what? I don't sit around and wait on him to pay nothing. If my husband, mm -hmm. and I love him dearly, and you know, if he walked out the house right to this day, my light bill gonna still get paid. Mm -hmm. I set Peggy up for that. Mm -hmm. Not because of him, because I didn't know him, but I done been through other guys have taught me. Men will teach you if you if you if you're teachable. Learn to pay your own thing. And I know my husband have always made money, but you know what? I still live in that same mode. Like if I come home, or if he if he decide to leave, please leave. If he decide to stay, please stay. You have to be there with your relationship so that you can be ready. You can't sit there and fall down because somebody leave out of your life. I'm going to still do me no matter what, because I was doing me when I met you, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm saying that in a positive way, not in a mean way. I got one of the, hope y'all get to meet him one day, but I got, I got a, he's a really nice guy. The guy that I married, I'm married to, he's a really nice guy, but I'm still me. Yeah. I still know how to take care of me independent, but yet enjoy having a husband. That's me. That's okay. Yeah. So uh, I just needed y'all to know that. Yeah, you know, that's that's good, Peggy. Um, you know, and I think that uh, hearing hearing these stories, you know, it does it bring comfort to our hearts. I was thinking about something when Miss Peggy talked about, um, you know, rearing the children and 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 then no, we all have different um, um, learning styles. And then also, you know, uh, it's going to be God that teaches us. I love what she said. If you if the Lord has been taking care of you, don't you bring in somebody into your life that does not serve the God that you serve, you know, because it's going to cut your supply off. You know, it's just like you getting benefit. You know, we hear of people um, uh, being married to certain people. And if they remarry, it cuts their benefits off. You have to think about that stuff. You know, if you can't afford to get them benefits cut off like that, you got to stick with the one. But uh, one of the things um, uh, me having uh, three, three children. And I did, I did just what Miss Peggy did. I, I lived a very private life with my kids, uh, raising my children. Um, didn't, we didn't, we didn't always live, uh, in the inner parts of Tyler. We always lived on the outskirts. Uh, I did that on purpose, uh, because, uh, my, I, I just believe I just have a very unique personality and I've never liked being in the middle of, um, I never like being associated with certain things, you know, so I can live in the city, uh, but I don't have to be identified with what people do in the city. So I always chose, you know, different things to do. But one thing I learned about my children when I was raising them, especially the boys, 
Um, I used to, uh, I would always try to instill uh, certain things in them, but I learned something about the children too. Uh, they don't all have the same uh, nature. Like I have a white collar child and I got a blue collar child. And then I got a child that's a blue and a white collar. And what do I mean by that? Those blue collar children are normally going to work with their hands. You know, they're the ones that will get out in the fields and they'll change the tires and they will, you know, do anything, get out in the yard and do all that kind of stuff. I learned early in life that uh, my boys were not like that. They they were just not like that, you know? And uh, and so what I did was I started teaching them a little early that if you're gonna be blue collar, you'll be able to save a lot of money, you know? Uh, you know, be able to do a lot of things on your own, fix it on your own or whatever. But if you're white collar, you're gonna have to make the money to pay for what it is that you need. So I, I started instructing those boys early in life if you are not going to be the one that get out to do it, you're going to have to make the money so that you can. And the boys have, they live their lives accordingly. You know, that, that blue collar, you, let me tell you, he'll get up and do anything for you. that white collar. Yeah. Anything he'll do anything for you, but according to what his level is, and you got to be okay with that or whatever their styles are. I don't try to make one be like the other child. They both have their unique personality, but the great thing about it is they complement each other. I always tell them, y'all are yin and yang. Y'all complement each other so well. And I think that's one thing we have to learn even about uh, the people that we're doing life with. How do we complement one another? Don't try to make somebody be who you have seen, you know, out in the world or whatever. Don't even try to make your family, you know, be what you've seen out there in the world. Find out the unique fingerprint for your family. And even if you have been raised up one way, you got to still get out there in the real world and find your unique fingerprint. Maybe maybe the, the family did live more of a blue collar life and that's not the life you want to live, but you got to know you're going to have to do something out there to where you can make an earnest living, you know, so that you can pay for these things to do things. Um, I have one girlfriend, um, she, she gets very, very upset uh, with her daughter-in-law uh, because her daughter-in-law, she married uh, a gentleman uh, that can uh, provide for her in such a way to where she can live the type of lifestyle she wants to live, like bringing a nanny in the home and doing things like that. And uh, my girlfriend, she just gets literally lit about that. And I told her, I said, uh, that's not yours to determine. If she decided she wants to get a nanny in her household, I'm quite sure there's a reason for what she's doing. And if her husband, who is your child, is agreeing with it, that means that he's in agreement with the lifestyle that she lives. Even though he may have come from a totally different lifestyle, you can't make your daughter-in-laws live the same lifestyle of what you raised your children. Or you can't make your son-in-laws live the same lifestyle of what you did. You got to give them the respect for them to have their own unique family. That's why it's not good to have all of this control, you know, with your children, because they're going to marry who they want to marry. And it may be totally different from what we did. So we have to make sure, uh, you know, to understand our children. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Identify who your children are, know what it is that they like, listen to what they have to say, you know, because they may tell you, they may show you a more excellent way, maybe something that you may not have discovered, you know, in life. So I think these are great, great pointers. Oh my God, great testimonies. I love the strength of your voice, Peggy. I love the strength of your voice, Nan. You know, and uh, I'm I'm so uh, proud for us. I think we got the definitely the right ones in this room uh, that will be open and honest, especially with ladies, you know, to help them to understand, you know, this world that we're living in, you can't depend on other people to do things for you. You know, it's good. Any, anything anybody does for you outside of what you do, it's a, it's a gift. You know, that's just a, that's an extra additive, but to know to do the part that God has given you to do, it makes your life so much more enjoyable when you don't have to depend on other people to do things. So, and then last thing, don't depend people to do for you what your mom and dad did for you. Don't, don't, don't put that weight on them. You know, my dad did this and this is what, 
No, if you if you want that, you got to find out how your dad uh, heart how his heart beat. Your dad may not have dad may have started out just like your spouse and worked up to where he is. So a lot of times we got to ask the right question. Remember, love runs deeper than the heart can imagine. Maybe you've never seen that and asking the right questions is going to be key with that. So thank you ladies so much. We appreciate y'all. We are at that eight o'clock hour. And for those of y'all that have hung in there, thank y'all so much. I'm glad them charges hung up and, you know, stood with you, the Wi-Fi, you know, all of that. But uh, thank you guys so much for coming to Miss Peggy. Thank you. Even, you know, she still looks good out there in her car, y'all still looking good. And we appreciate, we appreciate your dedication, your love, Miss Nancy. Thank you also, even in the midst of your transition of what you are going through right now. Thank you for showing up and being a part of the room. And uh, it really sets a great tone for us. Uh, Y'all, we're going to get ready to close out. Uh, many of you know, uh, we're on the call on Tuesday when Harlan came in and I mentioned a fast uh, for this particular year, uh, we're going to we're going to open the door up for our fasting on the day that Harlan comes in on Tuesday and we're going to do 21 days. This is our way of unifying our hearts together within this ministry, uh, making sure that we have one sound, one rhythm. Uh, making sure that when we come in, that we are here to bring out the best in everyone. And then it also sets a tone for everybody else that's going to come in. This is just the 10% that we have given to God. It opens up the door just to let you guys know where we're going. But I promise you, it's going to be a bunch of people coming through these doors in this 2023 year. And we want to definitely set the tone properly in this room to let them know that we are about the kingdom. Uh, we are uh, a kingdom led we stand for righteousness, even though we've gone through some things, don't count me out. Uh, so we welcome you guys to come on in and join us for our fasting. More details will be shared on that on the 8th uh, when Mr. Harlan, or uh, whatever day that is, Mr. Harlan comes back in. And we hope that you guys will be able to join in with us. I, I have taken into consideration that um, uh, the um, um, uh, Valentine Day is in the middle of it all. So I have, I will make sure to consider that so that you guys can still celebrate with your loved ones and enjoy your time together. So, but I want to say thank you so much, Miss Nancy, Miss Peggy, all of you on the line. Thank y'all so much for being, uh, making Breakfast of Champions what it is. And I pray that as you leave today, that you will think about something that was said, um, you know, find your part of it. You know, I always say, eat the fish, spit the bones out. Uh, come on in as you come into the table, take the part that you lead, need and leave the rest at the table. Somebody else can eat that. Go back, listen to the replay, you know, find out what you may have missed. You may have been distracted this morning, but go back and listen to the replay. And last but not least, be sure to share, to share uh, this with others. Now, all you got to do is share it. It's up to them whether they come in because it's got to be the right timing. It's got, they got to be the right energy for us as well. So just share it. Allow God to bring the right people in. And I promise you, God would do exactly what he said. Last but not least, those of you that need private coaching sessions, do not miss out on that opportunity to come in just a little bit closer. Uh, Y'all can go out to my website, www.marylanddeniseservices.com. Check out ways that you can get connected to private uh, sessions with me. Just maybe little things that you need to tweak in your life or get that edge off of you or find the balance that you need in life. But go out there, check it out, come on into the programs. And I'm more than welcome to share with you guys. Uh, tomorrow, Mrs. Latoya Hansen will be in hosting uh, for us. And then I'm going to come in and talk to you about uh, who uh, versus um, uh, um, uh, who versus why. Why? Who, who am I? Uh, who are the people in your circle? You know, why we do what we do and how we make this thing fit for us. And I promise you. God's going to do some amazing things. So until we meet again, we're praying for our Tyler family, our Texas family, not just Tyler, but for our Texas families and all that may be affected by the weather right now, the inclement conditions. And uh, we pray God's blessings and coverings and pray that those lights stay on and, you know, that we stay warm and safe and not get agitated about anything. Use this as a time, you know, to where you can uh, get in the presence of God to pray uh, to talk to him about what you want to do and, you know, to make them crooked places straight. So as we close in prayer this morning, I pray that you guys will receive the prayer 
in the spirit in which it was given and that it would meet you right at the point of your need. Uh, so Father, we thank you this morning. First of all, thank you for allowing us to get on the line. Uh, we're praying for Mrs. Cookie, Mrs. Nene, um, all of those that were not able to join in because of, you know, maybe not uh, having the ability to do those things. Thank you for those that pushed through on this morning. And I pray that you would add a special blessing to their lives. I pray for those that are coming in for the replay, uh, same anointing in the room as it was, you know, same anointing as you listen to the replay as it is in the room. Uh, just remembering that parenting is a lifestyle. You know, it, it's a life. It's something that we're going to do forever. You know, so I pray that the Lord would teach us how to buckle down, uh, to get in position, uh, to let the main things be the main things, to readjust ourselves, uh, to uh, check the temperature of our homes, find out who God has given to us. Uh, many times we do the same thing that we do in our personal life. We try to dictate to God who we are, what we're going to do. And then we try to dictate to the children the same thing. Lord, help us take those control factors down. Uh, these are your children. We don't even belong to ourselves. We belong to you. And Father, we're going to set our affection on the things that are above your will, your way. Yes, God, we will obey. And Father, we will watch the children for them to show us who they are. And Father, our job is to help instruct them. That's all we are to do is to be a good example to them, but to let them have a mind of their own to think. We got enough children out here that are mimicking things that they have seen. And uh, Father, this thing is not fitting for them and it's causing a whole lot of distress. It's causing a lot of ailments, uh, causing a lot of uh, pressure to perform, uh, all because we're trying to measure ourselves up to someone else. We thank you so much for the leading and guiding of those that you've placed in our lives, but we also thank you for our life. It's not, a, it's not a, just a phrase that we say we thank you for our life, our health, and our strength, but we really do. We thank you for the one-on-one, -on -one, our life, our one-on-one, -on -one, our health, one-on-one, -on -one, our strength. That's outside of our marriages. That's outside of our children. That's outside of us being parents and being managers on the job. You give us an individual strength. So Father, for that, we say, we say thank you. Father, I pray that you would allow us to demonstrate such a love that it will, uh, it, it will uh, show itself to be bigger than the heart can imagine. That love that comes deep from you. Father, uh, change the direction of our thoughts, even on this morning. You know, help those things to align up with you. If there's anything that's out of alignment with us and we have caused the disalignment, because we were so rigid. I pray, Lord God, that you would do a new thing in us. Help us to remember that old things have passed away and everything is becoming brand new. Bringing in a child into this world is brand new to us. Bringing in a second child is brand new to us. Bringing in a third child is brand new. Losing a child is brand new. Bringing in a foster child is brand new. Fostering children is brand new. You know, so Father, help us to see deeper than the eyes can imagine. Our hearts, we got to grow into this kind of love. And that perfect love, it never fails. So Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for Miss Peggy, Mrs. Nancy. Thank you for all the ladies that have joined in. And I just say, do a new thing in us. This year, it's going to be a new thing in all of our lives. We're, we're trying hard to hold on to the past, but you're not going to let us do it especially if it's holding us up from getting to where we need to be. So thank you in advance for the pressure points, God. And I pray that you would allow us to get some coaches along the way that can help us to walk us through this valley. Because sometimes it's going to feel like a valley in a shadow of death, but Lord, help us to walk through with grace and with ease. Help us to find the people that we need in this season. Help us to change guards where we need to change guards. We've gone as far as we can go on that particular level, but something in my spirit says, that there is a greater side to this. So Father, we thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the doors opening up. Thank you for provision being made, Lord God, for everything that we stand in need of. And Father, let our heart be well with what you're doing with us because it's gonna bring about some sweatless victory. We won't work as hard as we used to. So Father, as we get ready to dismiss this morning, never let us dismiss from your presence. Love, it will conquer all.
in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining this morning. And we look forward to coming back with you on tomorrow in Jesus name. Amen.